I've compiled all of the woodworking business advice that I've given over the last three years here on my channel into one video. You're not going to want to miss a single one of these. Let's get started. About four years ago is when I started picking up woodworking as a hobby. Uh, I was jumping into it. I still had a full-time job at the time, and it was kind of my escape from my day job not going well. So I would come home and I would build stuff. Well, as I was progressing, I did that for a few months, I needed tools. I, want, I needed more tools. Well, I wanted the hobby to pay for itself. So I made like three cutting boards. I actually sold them to a guy about an hour away from me. I sold three of them. So after the sale of those cutting boards, I was super excited. I was hooked on, okay, I can make money with this. How, how, what else can I do? And so I made a couple more items over the next few months and sold them. And uh, while this was going on, I was investigating how I could like take this to the next level. Well, I came across some YouTubers that were using CNC's just to create projects. And one thing led to the next. I was like, there's people that make money with these things. And so I did a bunch of research and I ended up buying my first Shape Oko in 2018. Started making things with it. I had no prior experience. Started making things with it to sell. I built up to my first um, craft show, which was at a wine market. So that went on for about a year. I tried different sales um, routes and had some not so successful and some successful. That's the, the Cliff Notes version of my personal story. The reason I share all this is because when you start, it is super important to think about what you want it to be or what it can be in your situation. If you have a full-time job already, that's probably gonna limit you on what you can do with the CNC business from home. But uh, that doesn't mean that your goals can't be like mine. My goal was to leave my day job and um, I worked towards that. So it's the first step to this whole thing is thinking about what you want it to be. In my mind, there's three different things it can be and it can become all three at any time. Um, the first one is just a side hustle. The second is full time. And then the third one is, hey, I just wanna sell a few things to pay off my machine. I wanna justify buying a machine so I can pay it off. So whatever price that is, two, 3,000, 5,000, whatever it is, I just wanna make that much money so I can justify the purchase. And all of those are okay, but at the beginning, before you jump off into, I wanna make this and do that and do that, think about, uh, it'll save you so much time and you'll be so much more effective. Think about what you want it to be and start there. The next thing you need to do is start creating projects that you personally are interested in. Well, duh, Andy, who makes things that they're not interested in? Well, hang on a second. There's a specific reason why you wanna make things that you are passionate about. And that's because you're already an expert in this niche. And why is that important? It's because you know this better than anybody, meaning you know the people that you're gonna sell to better than anybody, because it's, it's you. So what motivates you? What do you like? What problems do you have? What, what problems can you solve? What are people in this niche going to like? Okay, so when you're coming up with new products, keep these two things in mind. One, try to create a product that will help somebody remember something. There's an emotional attachment there, whether it's a good event in their life or a bad event in their life or something they want to memorialize those products sell really well. The second approach is to create something that is functional. People like things that hang on their walls, but they like things that they can use as well. So if you can create something that is aesthetically pleasing, but also has a function, aiming for one of these two will ensure that your product provides value to your customer, making them more willing to buy. The next step is to start documenting your work on social media. This can be done on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, just make sure that it is a business account. Create this account just for posting and documenting your work to create a portfolio to use in the future. I know a lot of people have anxiety when it comes to sharing the things that they create, let alone on the internet. So first of all, I wanna acknowledge that that feeling is real and there are a lot of people that it affects. A little later on in the video, I'm gonna share some tips to help to get over that anxiety and that fear of sharing, but Let's continue on the path we were heading first. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is find people that are doing similar things to you. Whether that's people with more experience than you or less experience than you, the best is a mixture of all of them. And you can learn from each other. You can share mistakes, you can share in achievements, and you can learn from each other. 
It's a common misconception out there that we have to do this ourselves. Now, yes, you have to put the work in yourself and you have to make it happen yourself, but it's okay to learn from people and it's okay to ask people questions and say, hey, what do you think about this? And the, the person that seeks a community like that versus the person that does it themselves, the person that seeks the community will always be ahead of the person that does it themselves. Trying to figure it out yourself, you will, it's just slower. You can do it. And, but it's just slower. So some good places where you can find these groups. There's a lot of Facebook groups. There's a lot of groups on Instagram. One good way to find the groups is just to search um, for them. Search for um, CNC business or desktop CNC or hashtag uh, CNC woodworking. And you'll start finding uh, people that are doing similar things um, as you want to do or that you are doing. The next important thing to do is to ask for feedback. Now that you've got your product or project made, go to the people that are similar to you in those niches or have the same interest in you and ask them what they think of it and ask for honest feedback. You can also do this with family and friends, but just beware that they tend to sugarcoat things and not tell you the truth. All right, so now it's time to take that feedback that you've gotten and apply it to your product. Now, not all of it. Obviously, you can throw out the stuff that you don't want, but I'm sure that you've gotten some great ideas because it happens to me every time. I'll have an idea for something and I share it and I get so many ideas that I never thought of that really made my, my original idea that much better. So this is the time that you can really improve your product. All right, the next thing is to post, list, go sell uh, the thing that you made. You have a finished product now and it's not time to stop. It's time to get it out there, which can be a scary step. What if it doesn't sell? What do I charge? I've got a lot of videos about all of those topics um, that you can find at the end of this video. But the important part here is to go where your people are. All right, so at the very beginning, you created something that you were interested in. So where would you go to buy this? Where do people like you go to buy these things? Go there first. Don't go to the masses. Don't just throw it up on Etsy and hope it sells. No, go in front of those people that you created it for, and you won't have to sell it all. If you created a product that has an emotional connection or helps them solve a problem on something they can use, the item will sell itself. Okay, so now let's look ahead a little bit. We've been making things and we've been documenting it and we've been building a portfolio. Now we can direct people to our social media and be like, hey, look at my portfolio. Look what I'm capable of. And what I found personally is that people come to me with their own ideas. So they see my Instagram and they're like, wow, you're capable of that. Well, then you must be capable of this idea that I have. And this is a game changer for your business because people are start bringing you ideas. Customers start bringing you ideas and like, hey, can you do this? A little earlier, we talked about the anxiety of posting to social media. And this really comes back to anxiety of sharing and putting ourselves out there. And so I've got a couple tips to make it a little easier uh, this isn't going to solve all the problems, but I've got some tips that will make this process a little easier. All right, the first one is use Instagram. Instagram is known as the friendliest social media platform. Now, I'm not saying there aren't trolls on there, but it is a lot more reserved and a lot more chill than a lot of the other social media platforms. Whatever you do, avoid Reddit at all costs. Just don't post to Reddit. Take my word for it. Okay, the second tip I have is create a profile that no one knows about. Don't share it with anybody. Don't invite your friends to it. So just post for a little while and try to build up that confidence, trying to get your feet wet before you dive into the deep end. Uh, don't use hashtags. So people can't even search for your stuff. Um, you can even go another level and you could, you could make your account private. And so only people that you invite in will be able to see um, what you post. And it can feel not as overwhelming to just jump into the social media deep end. And the last tip I have for you is forget all of the analytics and pressure and likes. And there is real pressure with, oh, my photo only got 10 likes this time versus, oh, it got 100 likes. And then you start chasing that. And I'm guilty of that. That it leads to nowhere good. Now, one thing I will say, the more secluded you make yourself, the less exposure you'll get, which is perfectly fine but that will limit the uh, number of opportunities that you have to share your work with people. And in order to grow a business, uh, you need to be out there sharing what you do with people. And so keep that in mind. You don't have to do that right away, but 
working towards that is a key. If this is something that you want to do, but you still don't know where to start, just start making things and sharing them with people. Once you're a little further along, then you can start thinking and implementing some of the things that I've been talking about. But don't get overwhelmed at first. It starts with making things and sharing them with people. I wanna focus in on three of the things I shared in that video and elaborate on them a little further. All right, number one, I've invested money into things that have made me money. I can't tell you how critical this is to my success. I see all the shops out there. There's some beautiful shops. I want all the tools myself, um, but it's really critical to that I prioritize in buying things, investing into my shop and things that return monetarily. Now there's a lot of things that go into that. Everything can make you money. Everything can save you time, but prioritizing a list from top to bottom. Um, I've upgraded the Z axis to the HDZ. I've purchased the bit setter. Other than that, it's a completely stock machine, the Shaboko XXL. The first one is investing money into things that make you money return on investment. I still look at investing money into my business the same exact way. And honestly, this is how I got into CNC in the first place. I was doing some other woodworking projects, not CNC projects, and I was like, how can I monetize this? Came across CNC and I was like, there is a lot of potential there. So that is why I purchased a CNC way before a lot of other traditional woodworking tools. Looking back, this has been critical to my business's success, especially getting started. At the very beginning, I chose to build my business debt-free. So I didn't borrow money to invest in tools. I paid cash for everything. Now, I do believe that there is a place to leverage borrowed money to grow a business, you know, business expansion, um, getting into a commercial space, there is a place for that. But the reality is, is debt crushes small businesses all the time. It is the number one reason why small businesses fail, because they cannot carry the debt that they took on. Also, by not taking on any debt, uh, my business has remained 100% agile. I have agility to be able to turn on a dime. When something isn't working, I don't have to keep going down that path. I can turn really quickly because I don't have any commitments down that path, down a certain path. This allows me to take more risks. I don't have to think, oh man, I really think there's an opportunity there, but I'm not sure exactly, but I can't even pursue it because I know I have this looming payment or this, this looming obligation over top of me. Another huge component when it comes to choosing how and where and when you invest money into your business is what is your backdoor plan? Always have a backdoor option. When you're, when you're going out on a new path, have a backdoor, have a fail safe. And so my fail safe is being debt free and being able to, if heaven forbid, if something bad happened to me, I literally could stop everything I'm doing and honor my con contracted obligations to fulfill my work. But other than that, I don't have to worry about oh, how am I gonna, I gotta keep working that machine because I, I financed it. That is my fail safe. And that's why I share investing debt free is because um, that is my fail safe. That is my ultimate flexibility. And that flexibility to me is priceless. Number two designing items that are easily replicable. What I mean by that is I try to specialize not in individual custom orders with V carving and stuff like that. I want to design myself unique and custom items and learn how to replicate them. It's a trade-off. You can get more money for individually custom items, but you can't produce as many of them. So my goal was to find sales channels where I could create unique products on a higher volume scale. So I had asked myself, is the time for completely custom individual pieces worth the payoff? And for me, it wasn't. I can make more money and sell more items when I design and produce and replicate a particular item. All right, the second area I wanna focus on is custom work versus wholesale work. I generally have the same thoughts that I shared in the video, but let's elaborate a little bit on them. And first, when I say custom work, I'm talking about 100% one-off, um, 1v1 customers, um, where a customer comes in, tells you what they want, you make it, and you sell it to them. The time it takes to design something once, set it up on the CNC once, and do everything once, and you're never gonna do it again, you're never gonna use that file again, 
the return on, inve on that investment is really poor. Uh, the time it takes versus what someone's willing to pay is just, has never been there for me. So one of the things I've learned with wholesale in the last three years is when you lose a wholesale client, it hurts a lot more than just losing one retail client. This is because you have less customers and their higher value accounts. So when you lose one of those customers, a bigger chunk of your business is gone. So what I recommend and what I've learned is to diversify, diversify, diversify. Diversify your revenue streams. Do not put all your eggs in one basket. If something is really, really good, that's, that's great. If there's a, a contract or a customer that's really, really good, try to find another one of those customers. Try to find two more of those exact customers. Because if there's one of them out there, there is more. And then if one of them falls apart or they change the style of their products or they discontinue a product or any of those things, you still have those other ones to fall back on. So I will say one of the biggest lessons I've learned over and over and over again, and it's just become more clear uh, over the last three years, is what kind of products sell. So I found that there's two categories, either something that's completely unique, something that people haven't seen before, um, and whether you take a, uh, a, an existing product that's out there and make it a different variation, um, but the product, those, these types of products make people say, wow, I haven't seen that before. Those products sell really well. The second type of product is a more generic product. I think of a cutting board or charcuterie board, but it's personalized. So that personalize, the personalization element is huge on generic items. All right, number three, I have all my layouts for the CNC machine exactly the same for a particular item. So I mill those items down to a certain size. So then it's just plug and play. It, or each piece is a certain size. So I don't have to re-zero anything in between pieces. So I know exactly how many items I can get from a certain size piece of stock. The third one I wanna jump into because I think it's such a huge thing when it comes to efficiency on the CNC. So three years later, I'm still doing the same techniques that I did before when it comes to this. Cutting all my stock to the same exact size, width, length, thickness. Um, and then I can uh, efficiently stack those and use the space on my CNC bed to, rather than just cutting one board at a time, or cutting different size boards and you have to change the file dimensions and re, uh, do the layout of your products, you can stack really, really easily on your CNC bed. So your material layout in your CAD software matches the material layout on your CNC bed. And this, is, this enables you to cut uh, larger batches, uh, reduce number of setups, reduce the number of CAD, setups, the, the, the amount of CAD work, and really saves a lot of time, especially when you're making batches of products. So first I wanna give you a little context, a little background information on these four different events to kinda of give you a scope of what they look like. So the first event we did was a fall market. It was local and it was the end of October. So this event was pretty small and it had an attendance of about 300 people. The second event we did was a Christmas market in the middle of November. And this one was a little larger. It had an attendance of roughly a thousand people, maybe a little bit more. The third and fourth events were the same exact events just held on back-to-back -back weekends. Now, these were two-day events held in the middle of December, and these were true Christmas markets. I never heard an estimate of the number of people that attended this, but based on the first two events, I'm estimating it was somewhere around 1,000 per day. These two events were also held at a brewery event space, and they had food, um, so it was a little more involved than the first two. So that gives you a little bit of an idea on the size of these events. None of them were 50,000 people, you know, giant state festivals or anything like that. So what worked and what didn't work? Well, let's start with what didn't work first. So the first thing that comes to mind that didn't work was we made this product. It was a pumpkin tray. We made two different sizes. We made uh, bigger ones and we made smaller ones. We made a total of 20 of these trays. Uh, for the fall event, for the first event, and we sold two of them, two of the small ones. And then we brought them to the other event that we did in the middle of November, right before Thanksgiving, thought they might sell, didn't sell any. 
So this product was a complete bust. So we tried different price points. We tried different presentation styles, tried a lot of different things. So what I think it was is that these products just weren't substantial enough. If these were an inch and a half thick, double the thickness, makes a bigger statement, I think they would have done better. But also, I don't know if pumpkins are where it's at. Maybe if I did a turkey, or maybe if I did a leaf, or maybe if I did something a little more unique than a pumpkin, we would have had more success here. Another product that I completely busted on were these beer flight boards. I came up with this product because we were going to a, a brewery event space, and there I knew there was gonna be a lot of beer drinkers there, and I figured it would be a unique gift for the guy that's hard to buy for. But I only sold one. I made 12 of them and I only sold one. Uh, we tried with the glasses, without the glasses, to include the glasses. We tried a couple different price points. I don't have any idea of why, like what to do, what I could have done better, maybe a more unique design. I don't know. But this product was a complete bust. Even though I made a product for a specific person in mind, I just didn't connect and didn't sell. The third thing that did not go well, and I'm going to preface this with, this kind of makes me look silly and I have no idea where it came from. But anyways, when someone asks you how much something is, we had everything priced, but some people just don't see those and they just rather ask. So when someone says, hey, how much is this? For some reason, I started out saying, we have $25 on them today. Why I included the today, I have no idea. I honestly do not have an explanation for it. Um, I did that for first the first couple hours and my wife was like, hey, you probably should stop saying today because that, mis that leads people to think that they're gonna be a different price tomorrow. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And I, and I still slipped up one more time and I said, oh, those are $40 today. And the lady, the customer looked at me and she's like, today? what are they gonna be tomorrow? And I'm like, I looked at my wife and I'm like, ugh, and she walked away. Uh, the, the customer walked away. But regardless, I don't know where that came from. It's not a good strategy. It was just, I think maybe a little anxiety and I, that's just what came out. But I quickly changed that and I would just give a more direct answer. So this is a great lesson though. Your words matter to your customers. One time my wife described the lights in our lanterns. This was at the very beginning of our first show and she described the lights and she was someone was like well what if i didn't want a different color of lights my wife was like well you can just rip them out and and shove new ones in there and so when that when that customer walked away i said hey probably not a good idea to use words like rip and shove maybe we're being petty there but it just sounds a little violent when you're talking about your product and uh, so your words matter when you are talking to your customer. So those were the main things that were just complete bust. There was other things that didn't work as well, but those uh, were the things that just completely busted and did not go well at all. But let's look at the things that did go well. Something that is really important that we try to do when we are at these events is engaging customers in authentic conversations. We came a lot across a lot of people that were from the same area that we were in, that knew the area that we grew up in, um, but just making that connection, that human connection is extremely important when you um, are at these events. The second thing is having unique products. You really want the customer to be like, wow, I haven't seen that before. Now, this is what helped us get into the last event that was somewhat competitive to get into and um, because we have wooden lanterns. No one else sells wooden lanterns. So these event organizers are looking uh, for vendors that have unique products because they know the people coming are looking for unique one-of-a-kind um, items. So our wooden lanterns are the unique product that no one else has uh, that does really, really well for us. The third thing is an absolute no-brainer and is that is taking credit cards. We took in $5,247 in credit cards. And it's just an absolute must in today's day and age. We use Square and Square charged us like $148 to process all of that money, which is an absolute steal. And so it's a no brainer. Sign up for Square, get the card reader. They're, they have different card readers and it's just a no brainer, something that you have to offer your customers. The fourth thing that worked really well for us is our lantern pricing strategy. We offered one lantern for $30 or two for 50. Now this is fantastic on this price point 
because a lot of people just want one for themselves, which is completely fine. But if they want to buy for someone else, one for them or one for someone else, it's only $20 more. The second lantern is only $20 more. So we sold a lot of two sets of lanterns for $50. And so they're getting them for $25 a piece. Pricing strategy worked excellent for us. Something else with price points that worked well for us is having smaller items. We sold over 40 of these DIY gingerbread houses for $10 a piece. Now, if someone doesn't want a bigger item, um, something that is small, something that is unique, cute for the kids, uh, it's really powerful to have that smaller item. We brought in over $400 in revenue just from a $10 item. The last thing that went really well for us is making friends with other vendors. Now, I know some people don't view that this way. They look at other vendors as uh, competition and they sit there and they don't talk to anybody the whole time. If you don't see the benefit in networking and collaborating, you are extremely, extremely missing out. And it is very important to do is how can I help other people be successful? And if they have that same in return, you can go so much further than just trying to go at it by yourself. So made some fantastic relationships through all these events and um, ones that we will continue to help each other out, continue to help each other be successful. And that is a beautiful thing. So take advantage of that. Before we break down the numbers to see if this was worth our time or not, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. This video is sponsored by PCB Way. PCB Way is your one stop for all your PCB, CNC, 3D printing, sheet metal services. They do it all. Offering instant quotes, quick turnaround, and fast shipping, PCB Way is a great resource to have for your next project. So if you would like to incorporate electronics into your next project, or you need a rapid prototype yourself, look no further than PCB Way. So were these four events worth our time? Let's break down all of our costs. Fuel costs were $125. Sales tax is our revenue times 0 0.06 equals $427. We had some costs for food because we were at these events and I guess we could have packed a lunch or something like that, but we did have some food cost of $100. Between the time we spent at the event, uh, the time driving to and from, and setting up and tearing down, we had about 53 hours invested into these four events. So we'll use that number here in a second. But when you subtract all of our costs from our revenues, that equals $6,470. But that number does not include our product cost. But I know that we have about a 75% profit margin across all of our products. So what we can do is we can take that $6,470 number times that by 0.75, and that equals $4,852.50. This number is our net profit. Now, the one thing that we haven't taken into account is the 53 hours it took us to perform these events, to set up, tear down, travel, and the time at the events. So if we take our net profit number and divide that by 53, that number is 91.56. So this means we made $91.56 per hour setting up and going to these events. But that's not all. What this $91 an hour doesn't factor in is the number of business cards that we handed out to individuals. It doesn't include the direct product feedback we got from actual customers, which is extremely valuable. It doesn't include that. And it also doesn't include the other business owners that came up to us and wanted to collaborate on future projects. It also doesn't include the new friends that we made with other vendors, people that are trying to do the exact same thing as us. But maybe my favorite part of all is having real conversations with people that have nothing to do with a sale or a product. It's really easy to get wrapped up in the numbers alone, but it's really neat to meet different people and to share stories and to connect with them. You never know whose path you'll cross and what kind of impact that can have on you or can have on them. To say the least, these four events were well worth our time. A big thank you to my wife. Literally, this doing these events would not be possible without her. So thank you to her. Also, a big thank you to all of our customers for supporting our small business. Overall, success starts with being selective with the events that you are going to attend. But there's no way around it. There is some risk anytime you're trying to sell the things that you make. No matter what avenue you pick, there is some risk. 
but there's also things in your control that you can do to limit that risk. So the things I shared about what didn't go well and what did go well, focus on those things because those things are the things that are in our control. What a week. I think we made over 50, I know we made over 50 items uh, this week in prep for this show. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this. It's being called a fall festival. So there are going to be food trucks, there's going to be pumpkin painting, uh, and it's hosted by our local government, by our local city uh, at the community center. So this isn't part of a big festival. Um, it's a one day event. Uh, middle of October uh, in Kentucky, so we're in the heart of fall. Um, I live in a city of about 30,000 people, um, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and on the contract, this event said they're expecting more than 500. They were pretty vague um, on it. That is a question mark. Um, they've advertised it on local radio, um, on social media, so there's definitely, they pushed it in advertisement. I think there's gonna be traffic there. I found out there's gonna be 45 vendors. Uh, so it kind of gives you an idea on the size of event. So why did we choose to do this event? Well, one, it's super close to our house. It's less than a 10 minute drive, easy setup. We've been there before. Um, we don't have to get up super early and drive two hours and set up and get there at 5 a.m. We literally are gonna be there at 7.30 to set up for an event that starts at nine o'clock. One of the main things that led us to this event was we've had a lot of success with our lanterns, specifically our fall leave lanterns that I talked in the previous video, why we got the new Thunder Laser. That's been very popular. We've sold over 200 of those now online, but we've never sold them in person. We never sold them locally. So we're really curious on how they're gonna be received and uh, they've been a hit online. We think they're gonna be a hit in person as well. Uh, so we've made 25 leaf lanterns, um, I believe. We're, oh, we're about 50 lanterns total. I think 25 of them are leaves. That product matches up with this event really, really well. So we've really gone through a lot of effort to try to match our products to the clientele um, with styles, with um, price points, with uh, just grab and go things, things that kids um, will be interested in. So we thought all that through and tried to match our products to that. So that leads us into our particular strategy for this event. I don't care what kind of business you're running, whether it's a products business or a services business, it does not matter. It is imperative and the a top priority to get your product or service in front of your ideal customer. You could get your product in front of the wrong customer all day long, and you, it could be a million of the wrong customers, and you could think, wow, I've got it in front of a million people. But if those people aren't interested, it doesn't matter. You'll have a lot greater success. I've talked about this extensively. I'll link in a playlist up here of all the different ways and how I've talked about this in the past, but it is imperative to match your product to your customer. My goal is to create products for these people at these events or um, and anything that I do is that people need, want, and can't live without. In a nutshell, my strategy is to figure out who is going to be there, who I'm going to be in front of, and to make a product that they will like and that they're willing to buy. So we're bringing a total of just over $2,000 in inventory for the day. And honestly, with the time and money that we have into this, if we don't sell $500 um, worth of products tomorrow, I'll consider this a bust. Just with the level investment that we have, anything less than that, I'm, I'll be pretty disappointed. Honestly, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but let's see if we can make $500 or more, hopefully blow it out of the water. A uh, thousand would be great. Selling 50% of our inventory, that'd be fantastic. Uh, but let's see what happens. We are about an hour in and we just crossed the $250 mark of sales. So exciting. A lot of our sales are from people that were already here, like other vendors. And I think that's something that's good to keep in mind. Other vendors can be your customers as well. Let's get into the results and what we learned from this show. Remember before the show, 
uh, one of my main concerns was attendance. And that actually came true. It was a true worry. So they were expecting 500 people and only 250 to 300. I asked the event organizer afterwards how many people came and that's how many they estimated. All right, so let's get into a few stats for the day. We made a total of 27 sales. So if you do the math, if there was 250 to 300 people and we made 27 total sales, we sold to 10% of the people that walked through the door, which is pretty crazy to think about that. That is very high. And I think that points to how good our strategy was going into it. So those 27 sales generated a revenue of $853. Remember our goal was 500 and we hit 500 before lunchtime. So you're probably wondering, well, what sold? How did you generate those sales? Um, what items were bought? So let's start with the least successful product and go all the way to our best seller. Probably the biggest surprise for the day, our least successful items were the pumpkin trays. The CNC pumpkin trays just did not hit for whatever reason. Got a lot of looks. Um, we tried, you know, uh, pitching them. We priced them at $45, which is a completely fair price for the large ones. And when we didn't get any interest throughout the day, we lowered that price to 35 just to see if it was price and still nothing. So that leads me to believe that that product was just pumpkins were just a complete miss. So the next item we sold seven out of 11 that we brought and that was the DIY Halloween house kits. They were a big hit. We sold them for $10 each. That was a great one to throw in. Um, obviously we didn't generate a lot of money off those but we had less than a dollar into them so the profit margin was very good um, and we sold seven out of 11. So that was a good item. All right, so the next one, we sold three out of the three that we brought were these simple catch-all trays that you actually didn't even see me make because I made them last year and they were left over just from, I made them a long time ago. And so we put them out there, put $25 on them. They're just basic uh, two walnut and one maple. And those went really quickly, surprisingly. The next item that got a lot of attention, we sold three out of the three that we brought and those were the kitchen bag and aluminum foil organizers. Those are really popular. We sold those for $60 a piece, which was a little high. You could tell people are hesitant, but they really, really, it solves a problem. Everybody has these bags everywhere in their drawer and they're willing to pay money to solve that problem. Great product. All right, and then our best seller. Remember, I didn't know how the lanterns were gonna sell. Uh, the lanterns, we sold 24 out of the 50 lanterns that we brought and we sold them for 25 or two for 40. And we had a, we only had two $25 purchases and then the rest of them bought multiple. They, um, the, the strategy of having fall ones and winter ones um, really worked with that two for 40 strategy because they could use one now and then they can use one for their Christmas decor. So our grand total for the day was $853. We shattered our goal of 500. 500. If we didn't sell 500, the day was gonna be a bust. So what was the success? Why did we have the success? Even though there was low attendance numbers, how were we able to send it to sell to 10% of the people that walked in that building? Here are some key takeaways on how we were able to do that. It's not one single thing. I wanna reiterate that. This is an approach. It, it is all these things working together. It's not just about coming up with the greatest product. It's not just about how we price. It's not just about getting to an event that is reputable and is going to have good attendance. It's not just about one of these things. It's all of these things together. I believe these were our keys to success. The number one was accepting credit cards. $572 of our $853 was accepted through credit cards. So accepting credit cards is absolutely vital. I also think the strategy of having the large flower. We didn't sell the large flower and that was kind of intentional and I'm okay with that. I priced it at $300, but it was the biggest item of the whole show. It was right in the aisle. People saw it, so many people complimented it. Then we could initiate a conversation with them. Another thing that it did was set the anchor price for our booth. They would see this item, they'd see the $300 price point and they would be like, whoa. And then they walk into the booth and everything else seems like a deal because they saw that $300 price point. So when they walk in and they see our lanterns and they're beautiful as well, and they're only 25 or two for 40, they're like, that seems like a really good deal. So the third thing is helping people envision 
our products in their space and how they're gonna use them. The LED lights from the gym that we were in were really, you couldn't even see the lights in our lanterns. A lot of people didn't even know they lit up. So I got the idea. I was like, we need to start showing pictures. We didn't sell one lantern in the first hour. Every person that came up after that, we showed them the picture um, of the lantern in a dark space because it reflects off the walls. And they were like, oh my goodness, that's so beautiful. And we sold 24 of those things the rest of the day. Without uh, those pictures, I'm betting we wouldn't even sold 10 lanterns. So whatever your product is, help people envision it in their space and how they're gonna use it and how's it gonna make them feel and how's it going to change their space. All right, the fifth thing that I kinda already hit on a little bit but was engaging in conversation. Every single person that walked by that was shopping, we said, hey, how are you today? That was it. And let them guide the conversation from there. A lot of them just continued walking but a lot of them came in too. If you go and watch uh, how other vendors are acting behind their booth, most of them don't even make eye contact with their customers. Everybody is like this. Now, do you wanna watch this video if I have my phone in my face and I have my phone buried and I can't, I'm not making eye contact with you, I'm not engaging with you? No, are people gonna to wanna to buy your items at a vendor booth if you're just sitting back there and letting people just walk by and with your head buried in your phone? Absolutely not. Like, I'm not talking about like sell and like be out there and being over the top, but just simply being present and engaging. And when, they're, when someone's looking at a product, show them, say, or just tell them something about it. Say, yeah, this has a food safe finish on it. And so it can be used for cheese and crackers or it can be used for vegetables. That's all you're doing is helping them understand the product because they don't know any of those things. All right, the last one is putting a little effort in your booth. There was several people at this event that just simply set their items on a white plastic table. That was it. We didn't do a lot. We literally spent 45 minutes setting up our booth. The only thing that we did was we had a couple rustic crates that we could kind of uh, layer things and get, get things up higher, get a little dimension. And then we used orange tablecloths. Literally, that's all we did. And we kept it on theme. Keep that in mind. A little bit of effort here can go a long ways to stand out and to get people feeling, right? We're selling, this was a fall festival. So we made it look like fall and followed that theme with both our setup, but also our products. Overall, I know that a little bit of forethought and a little bit of preparation will go a long ways when it comes to selling the things that you make at markets and shows. The best selling products on the market, no matter what you're selling, either are emotional or functional. Let me explain. So let's start with emotional products. What do I mean when I say emotional products? It kind of sounds like a soap opera a little bit, but what I mean is it's a product that makes you feel or remember something. These purchases a lot of times are emotional purchases or impulse buys. They elicit some emotion from the buyer. Some examples of where this happens are uh, destinations, places, on vacation. You think about all the trinkets and t-shirts and everything that's sold on vacation. It's typically not because of the item's quality, as most of these items are very low quality, but they are, uh, people want to remember. People want to remember the time they had on vacation. They want to remember the time they visited the Grand Canyon. They want to remember the time they went to a local market with their family and it was a great day. So they buy everybody something to remember that time. Another common scenario where emotional purchases happen are when someone personally wants to remember something. You see this a lot with military, whether it be um, making flags or bourbon barrel with um, different branches of the military carved into them. People wanna hang that up on their wall and remember that time in their life, but also um, they're part of something bigger than themselves. It could also be uh, clubs, I'm part of a club. And so it's kind of a, a thing on the wall, but that is emotional inside. It doesn't serve a purpose other than to look good and to remind somebody of something that's important to them. All right, so that is emotional products. What are some functional products? Now, as you can imagine, functional products have a function. Uh, the person purchasing them, it isn't so much of a emotional purchase. It is a logical purchase where they can see themselves using what you're selling. For example, cutting boards. The reason there can be a million bajillion cutting boards made out there is because people can see themselves using them. So they're usually an easy sell. The next example that comes to mind is furniture. 
building furniture, whether that's tables or chairs, uh, end tables, uh, bar tops. These are things that get used um, that are functional. They serve a purpose. Quickly, I want to tell you about the guide that I made specifically for people that are just getting started creating products and selling them for the first time. This step-by-step -step PDF guide will help you get the ball rolling on where to start, what steps to take on creating your first product. If you're interested, check out the link in the description for more information. So now that we've identified these two types of products, how can we go about selling them? I mean, it's one thing to make one of these items and it's another to sell them. There are two really important things that go into selling these products successfully. One is price point and two is your target, your audience. Who are you making it for? Let's break down price point first. This is a very big topic and it can go a lot of different ways. But for the sake of giving you a straight answer, because I know that's what you want, in general, emotional products are less expensive and functional products are more expensive. Someone is a lot more likely to pull $20 out of their pocket than they are $200 or $2,000. On the function side, you don't need as many sales of functional items to make the same revenue with emotional items. Now, I'm categorizing here very generally, and there's things that crisscross when it comes to price. But in general, emotional purchases are impulse purchases are typically less expensive than functional purchases. So what does this mean for your products? I would say to focus on small, less expensive emotional purchases and larger, more expensive functional pieces. The second thing that goes into selling these items successfully that is often overlooked, people usually stop at price point, but this one is just as, if not more important than price point. And that is, who are you creating this product for? A lot of times as artists, as creators, we just make something and then we want to sell it. But we had, we made it with something that we like and we think it looks cool, but then no one else ends up thinking it's cool. So when you're creating either an emotional product or a functional product, think about the person, the actual avatar, like th picture somebody that you're creating it for. The more specific you can get with this person and create a product for something that they would like, the easier sales will be. The goal is, is that you create a product at a certain price point for someone that says, wow, you created that just for me. I need that. So we created a product for a specific person. Now we need to get that product where that specific person is in front of them. Not just putting it up on Etsy and hoping the right person walks by. Those are very passive ways to sell, which are okay if that's in your goals, but you can be a lot more direct and you can be a lot more intentional. So think of some ways you can be intentional. I've got a friend who lives in um, an area where they have a covered bridge festival. And so he's going through the process of coming up with products at a certain price point for the people that are gonna be at this covered bridge festival that happens every year. He already has the place, he's gonna be there. So now he's identifying the people that are gonna be there and what they'll like. Most likely this is gonna be an emotional purchase. They wanna remember the time they went to that festival. With functional purchases, it's really, really, really important that you take pictures or if you're at a live show to set things up and stage things to help people picture the item being used. Rather than just setting all your cutting boards out and taking pictures of them even though they may be beautiful, they'll go a lot further if you place some items on them and stage them and take pictures or like I said, at a live event, you stage one of them. Really help people see how they're gonna use it and that will lead to more success and more sales. One thing I will add is that these two categories of emotional and functional are not mutually exclusive. If you can create a product that has a function and also can create some kind of emotional attachment, those are the products that are gonna sell the best. Think about a cutting board. The way to, it has a function, it may be beautiful, but it has a function, doesn't remind anybody of really anything, but if you can engrave a family name on it, oh man, the power of that coupled with a function, there you go. That's why engraved cutting boards do really well and so many people can sell them. Kids, grandkids, and pets. If you think about those three areas, people, including myself, spend a lot of money on those three areas. So there's a lot of opportunity there to sell things. The other thing is, is they're emotional purchases. They're not logic purchases. 
So in order to take advantage of this, we need to take our products where people are making those purchases. If you wanna see more success in selling the things that you make, create a functional product that makes somebody feel something at the appropriate price point and get it in front of the person that you created it for, you will find that these become your best selling items. I purchased my Shapeoko three years ago with no prior experience. It started as a hobby, turned into a side hustle while I was working my other full-time job, and then became the reason why I could jump into my woodworking business full-time. So let's jump right into the list of the top seven things that I've learned while profiting my last 10K. Now, I said profiting this time because a lot of you called me out on saying making last time, but yes, profiting. Number one, I need to always be seeking out new opportunities. What I've found in my own business is that as soon as I get comfortable, things tend to change. I think you probably can relate with that. As soon as we get comfortable in something, it seems like something changes that's out of our control. And because of that, I need to constantly be looking for the next thing and trying to um, spend some of my time investing in those new opportunities and developing them. What works today necessarily won't work tomorrow. Number two, I continue to experience high demand for CNC products. One of the wholesalers I work with, I've recently heard that they just want products literally for me to prototype something and send it to them. So these companies that have these sale cha sales channels established, they can't keep product in stock. And I think that might be part due to the pandemic we just went through and so much is online. Online sales has just exploded recently. I've recently added a second Shapeoko CNC to my shop. So one of the advantages, there's a lot of advantages and some disadvantages of having two smaller CNCs versus one big CNC is one floor space because I stack these two on top of each other. Uh, my shop is in my basement. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, is I can run two separate products at the same exact time. So I can be prototyping on the bottom one and I can be running a production run of something on the top. So it's really given me a lot of versatility. And if I get a really big order, I can run production on both of them and just crank things out really quickly. Number three, diversifying revenue streams. I talked about this a lot in other videos, but I think personally, this is one of the most important things in business is you need to diversify, diversify, diversify. And the reason is, is because things are ever changing. You don't want to put 75, 100% of your business in one basket because when that, if that basket disappears, your business is gone and then you're left scrambling trying to come up with other things. I think it's really easy to get laser focused on, okay, I want to make $100,000 a year. I'm going to do it this way. What are you going to do if that disappears? I guess do it all over again, but you're going to have these peaks and valleys. Um, so what I like to do is diversify. So if something disappears or I want to get rid of a section of my business, um, I still have this over here that will carry me through. So what this looks like for my personal business is uh, my CNC, and that is broken down into wholesale and a little bit of retail. I could develop my retail a little bit more. Commission builds, so I build a piece of furniture here and there. If the right one comes along, I'll take it. The other one that um, I do is YouTube. Now YouTube has turned into a business for me. And uh, so that's part of it. So keeping these, these three, four, five things and developing other ones, looking for other opportunities um, is really critical. You might be thinking, Andy, why aren't you just jumping into CNC full throttle? And uh, you just told me that the market is super demand. It's super, super hot. Why aren't you jumping into that? And so that has to do with my personal goals and my personal goal isn't to run a full-time CNC business. I have a lot of other personal goals, and so stay tuned to number seven, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. Number four, every opportunity is a learning opportunity. So I don't believe in failure. You can go back and watch some of my first YouTube videos, and you could consider those failures, but those first videos got me to where I am today, and then I'll look back a year from now and look at this video and be like, oh my goodness, that was horrible. But the idea is, is that I never stop improving. And the best way to do it is just to put it in motion. I would encourage you, don't be afraid to fail. Failing, a lot of quotation marks here, is inevitable 
and that's part of the process. And I'm sure you've heard people say that success is just dressed up in a thousand failures. And that is so true. The author Robert Kiyosaki puts it like this, the faster you fail, the faster you'll succeed. The only thing between you and success is failure. Number five on this list is prototyping. The importance of prototyping I've learned over and over and over again. Usually a new product uh, is the eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, you get the idea, iteration of an original idea. Recently, I tried out this new material, this layered plywood, and I was making some trays. I learned that the material was unpredictable and that I couldn't rely on it. And so uh, that led me to other materials and going down a different path. I've gotten a lot of questions on where to come up with ideas and how to go about that. If this is you and you wanna know how to get started developing products uh, to sell that you make in general, but specifically make on your CNC machine, I put together this guide, step-by-step -step guide, where I laid out a tried and true process that can be used over and over and over and over again. I'll put a link to it in the description below for you to check out. All right, number six, keeping overhead low, especially when you're starting out. This has been critical for Andy Bird Builds to still be in business. This has allowed me to have the flexibility and the freedom to try things out. A lot of businesses don't have that flexibility, they don't have that freedom because they need to pay bills and they need to pay them now. So that overhead consists of your space, your rent, your bills, monthly bills, any debt. Um, so all those things, all those fixed price things that don't change from month to month. And so by having a basement in my shop, um, paying for all my tools as I go, uh, I have very little overhead. And that is um, on purpose. For example, I've heard people talk about focus on the money coming in, don't focus on the money going out, meaning you have to spend money to make money, which is true to an extent, but if you can focus on reducing your overhead, that doesn't put the pressure on you on success fail. If I don't make a sale this month, I'm gonna be out of business. Or I can't afford to try this creative idea that might work out really well and might set my business up exactly where I want it to go. I can't afford to try that idea because I have to stick with what works in order to pay my overhead. Number seven, let your personal goals dictate the decisions that you make. It's really important for me that I don't let what someone else is doing dictate what I do because they may not have the same goals as me. So what everybody else is doing, including myself, for other people, for you, it shouldn't be exactly what you do. It shouldn't look exactly the same because most likely we don't have the same exact goals. This goes back to number two where I talk about demand, right? There's all this demand for CNC work. And I honestly could make a full-time living off from the CNC work. And that's great if that's if I'm trying to survive and I need to jump into more of that um, for a portion of my business for a time period to survive, right? But that's not my end goal. My end goal is not to run a full-time CNC business. Now that might be your goal. And if that is your goal, that's perfectly fine. You can jump right into that, but that doesn't mean I have to jump into it. Or someone, for example, someone might buy a CNC machine and um, just wanna pay for their CNC machine and then enjoy it for themselves, enjoy it as a hobby. That will look completely different than someone that's trying to run a full-time CNC business. Just because something is working for someone else doesn't mean that'll take me where I wanna go. The process of making products seems to be a pain point. Like I said earlier, the hardest part is getting started. Because of that, I put together a step-by-step -step guide that will help you get started making money with your CNC machine. If you're interested in that, I'll talk about it a little more later, but you can check it out in the description below. This new wooden tray design that I've been working on revolves around this material. Now I've taken a pretty much basic design tray and I'm trying to get this material to work. This is a colored layered plywood. You can get it from a lot of different vendors, but it is Baltic birch, 16th inch layers, and you can get it in a lot of different colors. So let's walk through these different prototypes from the beginning to the end and where I am now. So I've made these trays before, 
out of different materials, out of solid hardwoods, these hexagon trays. Combining with this material, I was like, that would look really cool. So this is my first prototype. Uh, I went a little smaller to save material and really wanted to see what it looked like. So that looks really cool. I like that. I was like, okay, I want to make this bigger. And this was kind of what I was going for. I was really happy with this progress. I'm um, really happy with the machining. So I went on to finishing. So the first finish I tried was a oil-based finish. And I wasn't really happy with the colors. If you can see, these are really bright colors on the edges. I wanted to maintain those that brightness and it seemed when i used an oil based finish it darkened the wood too much so i was like okay i need to go with a water based finish in order to maintain the wood's vibrant color so if you see the different colors here in the bottom that's because either the bed of my cnc machine or my z-axis or something is slightly out of square now we're dealing with sixteenths of an inch here so you really tell your weaknesses of your machines that usually you would not be able to tell. So I fiddled around with it and tried to change some of the machining th techniques and it just wasn't worth the effort. So what I learned from this was that I had to machine down to a point where there are at least two layers of the same color. So this doubles my room for error from a 16th inch to an 8th inch. One reason this is important when developing products is you want consistency. So if I listed these on my website and they looked one color, and then when someone ordered them and got two of them and they weren't the same color, they could be upset. So everything is cooking along and going fantastic at this point. I was really excited about the progress that we made that I was like, you know what? I want a little bit more wow to it. And so I never was really happy with the edges. So I designed this tray in Fusion 360 and got a more gradual incline here. So what it does is it really displays those colors and those layers. This looks extremely cool. I was really happy with it. Let's talk about this material price just a little bit. So this material is not cheap. I would have $8 in material cost in this one tray. That is really high. Um, when I do a walnut tray, I have less than $2 into material cost. So four times the material cost into this tray. That's pretty significant when you're thinking about uh, rejects and thinking about errors. $8 doesn't include my time, doesn't include machining, doesn't include design, doesn't include any of that. That's just material cost. That was a little scary at first, but I figured if I make a unique enough tray, I can charge more for it. So my plan was to charge $30 to $40 for this tray. And that might seem ridiculous, but if you do research right now, there's a lot of hardwood trays that are 30 bucks, and which I think is ridiculous. I would never buy, but I don't determine the market. I think that's an important thing to remember, just because you wouldn't spend it doesn't mean that someone else won't. This tray was actually my last prototype. And so I made a couple more of the same tray, same design, and I was really excited. I sent them off to have professional pictures taken of them, staged pictures for the website. And I was thinking, you know, I, I'm gonna get them up on the website next week. This is gonna be a success. I come down the next morning, the trays are sitting on this table, and this is how I find them. So that's not good. So obviously there was some kind of tension in the board and then when I cut out that material, it cupped. So I reached out to the manufacturer and asked them, hey, what do you think's going on here? And they said that that can happen and they were working with their manufacturer to work out the problem. So I sent them the pictures and I haven't heard back yet. As of right now, I have to kill this this idea and uh, I'm just not confident in it. I don't want returns and that's part of prototyping. So I was sitting on the porch with my wife one night after I had told her all of this and the great sounding board that she is, I was discouraged and uh, she was like, well, why don't you make your own plywood? And I was like, well, I had thought of that and it's really hard and I probably have the same problems because of the compression and you know gluing and all that. I was just giving a bunch of excuses because I was kind of giving up on the idea. She was like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about why don't you make it out of hardwood layers 
And yeah, you're not going to be able to get the 16th inch or 8th inch layers that you were looking for, but you still could make some cool designs layering uh, walnut with exotics like Paduk or Purple Heart. So I did a little research and there was, there's not any of that out there right now. And so with, the encour with her encouragement and her idea, um, I've started that prototyping process. So you'll find my step-by-step -step guide a little bit different than my current approach. And that's because I've been working with wooden trays for like three years. So that is a little bit different than just getting started. That's why I wanted to design a step-by-step -step guide on how to get started making CNC products. Because once you get started, you really get that ball rolling and you learn what works and what doesn't work. And you continue to learn what doesn't work, but that evolves over time. After I put out the 10 things I've learned making my first 10K with my Shape Oko, I got a lot of messages, I heard from a lot of you, which was fantastic, about where do you sell your items? I see you don't have an Etsy page. I see you don't have many items listed on your website. Are you selling through Instagram? Are you selling through Facebook? All these are valid questions and makes complete sense. I went over productivity tips in that video and if you're not selling items, you don't need to be productive. So the way I see it, there's two categories to sell in kind of umbrella categories. You have retail side and you have the wholesale side. So let's tackle retail first. Retail is anytime you're selling to the end user. But this covers things like Etsy, uh, like selling through your website, um, selling through Facebook, selling through Instagram to your end user. So this is not an all-inclusive list of retail opportunities but these are some of the ones that come to my mind first. These are also the ones that come to, I think, everybody's mind first. I mean, those are the ones we're used to purchasing from retailers. So I think that's the natural thing to think. Okay, I'm gonna make this thing. I'm going to sell it to somebody. Okay, let's define the wholesale side of things because this is a little bit of a foreign concept um, to people, um, again, because we're used to purchasing retail ourselves, so that's what we know. The wholesale side is a lot bigger than you actually think. So wholesale is anything that you're selling not to the end user, and you're usually selling it to someone who is going to resell it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, I make one of a kind pieces. Why would someone else make money off my piece? And although that's true in some instances, I mean, if you are a painter and you're painting elaborate paintings, most likely you're not gonna, that's not a wholesale item. But if you're selling something more utilitarian, let's say a wooden cheese serving tray, that is much more likely to be able to sell at a wholesale level. So I do realize that, that a wholesale level is not possible for everybody. So those are the two overarching categories. Are there any other ones? I'm sure there are ones that I've missed. Some other ones that I've thought of that are kind of a hybrid between the two are selling um, based on consignment where a boutique takes your items, displays them in their store, and when they sell, that's when you make money. And then they'll take a percentage um, off from that. Like vendor markets where you set up a booth, and they're really kind of common in my area. You set up a booth and set up your stuff, and you pay a booth rent, and usually a percentage is taken off from that also. Now that's something where you don't have to sit, because I also know that there are markets or craft shows where you set up a booth and sit and sell your stuff. Um, that's also a retail option. There are people on Etsy right now making seven figures. How is that possible? If you look at what they're selling, it's not all that unique. There are other people selling it. If you look at their pricing structure, it doesn't come down to that. I think it's really common for us to look at these Etsy stores and be like, well, I'm doing everything that they're doing. Why am I not getting the sales? and there's one secret ingredient through it all, but it comes down to something that is built over time, and it's brand recognition. Brand recognition leads to buyer confidence and leads to sales. The people that have been doing it for a long time have, you know, that little thing that says number of sales. They have thousands of reviews on their channel. I mean, think about it from our perspective, from a purchaser's perspective, I'm much more likely to buy something through Etsy that has a lot higher reviews and more reviews because I have the confidence. We want no hassles. 
So why would they buy from my page that says three reviews? I mean, it makes sense. There's a select few people out there that'll throw the small guy a bone, but at the end of the day, like, no, I would much rather buy from them than buy from me if we're selling the same product for the same price. So when we're first starting out and we make something beautiful and we throw it up on Etsy, we're like, wow, people should really like this. It very seldom has anything to do with your item, has very seldom anything to do with your pricing. It really has to do with buyer confidence. How do you get buyer confidence? It is, like I said before, it is simply built over time. And every one of those Etsy stores started from the ground up. So like I said, I went through this entire process myself. Um, over a year and a half period, I was doing other things, but I was testing the market um, in a lot of different ventures. So I started to think about how I could sell the things that I made and make some cash off them. I didn't have years to sit around and make things and not be able to sell them. That's a little bit of exaggeration, but you get the point. Also, it was a time versus uh, benefit to me. Now, I don't strive to be a product only business. That's just a percentage of my business. So I didn't want to spend all my time trying to develop this brand uh, just for it to be an aspect of my business. So it hit me one day. What if I could sell my products to these Etsy sellers on a wholesale level? I would look at all their stores and I would see that like I can make that product. So there's got to be a way that I can sell to them on a wholesale level, higher volumes, lower prices. So that's my big secret. I currently sell to three online retailers through various forms who have sold an accumulation of millions of dollars of products. Not of my products, but of products in general. They have the name. How can I be a help to them and provide them with unique custom products some that I've designed, some that we've worked together and designed on. How can I pitch it to them to where I would be a benefit to their business? So just in the last six months, I've created these relationships and I have products, my, my own products sold on a wholesale level in Saturday Night Live, HGTV, um, across the globe, my products have been sold just in six months. And so if you think about that, I mean, I'm way ahead of the game on just throwing my items up on Etsy and maybe I had five sales in the last six months. I've been turned down so many times. I've pitched my products and my ideas to many online retailers and I've been turned down more often times than not. It doesn't stop me. I've got three wholesale deals in place and this is just the beginning of it. Okay, a couple natural questions that come up. Uh, what about building my own brand? If I'm selling underneath someone else's brand, uh, I'm not building my own brand. And that's a great point. So what I've done is I've started slowly building my brand out through my website, through a little bit through my Etsy store. And this wholesale stuff takes the pressure off having those to produce. Those can kind of build organically over time and I can gain momentum and... Uh, my end goal is not to have an Etsy shop. That may be your goal and that's that's fine. I think oftentimes we think of things as all or nothing. But if you look at major corporations or major businesses, they do this all the time. They sell on a wholesale level to other retailers, but they also sell on a retail level. The one thing I would say about doing both is make sure you have agreements in place with your wholesale um, clients. You just want everything defined. The best clients are the ones that are in a completely different niche than you. That way you don't create any competition. All right, so I'll leave you with this. When you're first starting out making things and trying to sell them on your own, it's like you're merging onto a congested highway. You have a couple options. You merge on and you try to blaze a trail through all this congested traffic, which just leads to a lot of frustration and burnout. Or you can find an alternative route. The competition is fierce on this highway. There's a lot of people making things and trying to sell them. Are you gonna keep fighting that traffic to try to get to your destination, try to get to the results that you want, or are you gonna try to find an alternate route? Bear with me on this one, but pretty much what I did was I saw the congestion, I fought it for a little while, I parked my car, I walked out to the fast lane, I put my thumb up, 
as a hitchhiker and pitched what I could bring to those people that already figured it out and said, hey, will you bring me along? They've been driving the road longer than me. They know the road. I can learn from them and maybe I can entertain them on the way there where it's mutually beneficial. The very nature of an entrepreneur is being a problem solver. I encourage you to go out, be a problem solver and find that alternate route that works for you. All right, number one is you're too broad and you need to niche down. So it's natural to think that we need a lot of people so we can they can buy our items and that's how we're gonna be successful. You don't need a million clients or a million customers or even 100,000 customers. Would that be nice? Of course. If you try to appeal to everyone, you'll end up appealing to no one. Just for the fun of it, let's target the outdoor niche um, for this example. So you like the outdoors. Great, that's a pretty, a lot of people like the outdoors. Well, you like mountain biking. So now we narrowed it down a little bit more. So now we're in the, the outdoors mountain biking niche. Well, we can get more specific. What about downhill mountain biking? So now we've ruled out all the other mountain biking and now we're just down outdoor downhill mountain biking. Well, I think we can actually get more specific. We can add a, a geography to it. So what about downhill mountain biking in Colorado? Okay, so now all the people that like Colorado and like downhill mountain biking, we can target those people. We can make a product for those people that they're going to be attracted to and willing to buy. But let's just take a simple cutting board, for example. Instead of just making a cutting board and putting it out and hoping ever, hopefully somebody is gonna like it, why not make a cutting board that has a detail for downhill mountain biking in Colorado? whether that's an engraving, whether that's a saying, whether, whatever that may be, whether it's a special slot in the side where they can stick their cheese knife in, I don't know. But the, the point is, is that if you get more specific and make it for someone specifically, they're much more likely to buy it. All right, the second one is you. It's really easy to overthink this whole thing. So we need to stop overthinking and start acting and learning from our experiences. I know this one hits a little close to home and maybe a little personal, but I know a lot of you struggle with this because I struggle with this. And anybody that puts their, their personal work out there to sell struggles with this at one point or another. It's so easy to believe all the lies in our head. My work isn't good enough, so I gotta practice and I gotta get better before I can sell it. Or what do I sell this for? No one's gonna wanna pay that much for this. Or what will people think by me trying to sell the things that I make? But if you don't start, then you're not gonna know what the results are gonna be. Keep this in mind. You don't have to be perfect to start. You don't have to have everything lined up to start. You can get better over time and learn from your experiences. This is exactly the approach that I took when I started this whole woodworking journey. Number three is your product isn't right for your audience or your audience isn't right for your product. Now, this is digging a little bit deeper on number one. It is so important to figure out your audience in order to have success. If you don't know who you're selling to, you don't know who your client is, then you don't know what they want. You don't know what they need. To bring some clarity to this area, to help you out, I have a couple questions that you can answer for yourself. So ask yourself, what is my audience interested in? What problems do they have that I can help them solve? For example, one of my wholesale clients had a problem. Her current woodworker couldn't keep up with the demand. They were just tapped out, they couldn't make anymore. So I pitched it to her, hey, I can help you out and I can make those trays for you. So I started making them for her and that was as simple as that. So she was my audience at that point. So the audience doesn't need to be one umbrella thing. That's how we typically think about it, but it can be individuals. Another example is on my Instagram account. So on my Andy Bird Builds Instagram account, if I post a physical product for sale, no, there'll be no interest. That's because my audience on Instagram, I built it. They wanna see me actually make the thing. They don't wanna buy it. So I have a separate Instagram account and that's where I post my products at. And so now I have them separated because I have two different audiences. So I'm building a product base audience over here while I have a content audience over here. All right, number four is you're making the same items as everyone else. To solve this, 
You need to make something unique. It's really common, and I'm guilty of this. I look around me and see what's successful and what isn't successful. So although that is helpful to get started, what works and what doesn't work, if you follow down the path of someone else that's successful doing the same exact thing as them, they're always gonna be ahead of you. So if you identify a product that's successful and you're like, oh, I just need to make that product and, and then I'll be successful. That's not how it works because there's already people that are successful for a reason. They've already learned the ins and outs. They're already ahead of the curve. You're always gonna be behind them. So in order to stand out or to get some of those customers, is, is to make that product, but iterate on it, make it different, make it unique. So that way you can stand out rather than just blend in with all the other items that are exactly same as yours. All right, number five is no one can find your work and you need to create a portfolio. Customers can't buy your work if they don't know it's for sale. So I have found that social media is great for this. When I was first starting out, I used Instagram to document all my work and I would actually send clients to my Instagram page and I landed a lot of work that way. Now, as my business has evolved, I have a website that does the same thing. So it's really important for people to be able to see your work, to create that credibility and create that trust between you and them. I've found that this is something that goes a really long way when people can actually see what you've done or what you're doing. So these are things that I have personally experienced and have led to more success selling the things that I make. If you niche down and get more specific, if you put less thought and more action and learning from those actions, if you can identify your audience and figure out what they want and need, if you can make something unique and create a portfolio doing it, I believe that you will find more success selling the items that you make. So where did I learn how to spot business opportunities and to develop my entrepreneurial eye? Now, I have been fortunate enough to come from a family of small business owners. Now, don't go anywhere because I know that directly does not help you, but I'm going to break it down of what I've learned that where you can apply these things and develop your entrepreneurial eye so you can see things. So something like this I think is best learned through me sharing my personal stories and experiences. But then at the end of this video, I'm gonna pull all those things out and put them in a actionable list. Uh, and we'll review that list where you can focus on these key things in order to develop this skill on your own. All right, story time. So three days a week, I stop by this coffee shop. I'm a Keurig kind of guy, black coffee, uh, I don't really, you know, I don't know all the, the frou-frou drinks, but now I do because now three days a week I get a salted caramel latte with whole milk. Yeah, look at me go. The reason I share all this is because I've gotten to know the people inside the coffee shop. I've become a regular now. Just last week I struck up a conversation with Shannon, the owner, and we were just talking about business. We weren't even talking, I wasn't even like trying to sell her anything. I was talking about how her business was, how my business was future opportunities that she was gonna to expand to and that I was gonna to expand to, uh, just from an entrepreneur's standpoint, was so nice to be able to rub shoulders with someone else that has taken similar risks as you, that faces similar problems as you, uh, and it was just really fantastic. So every day when I walk into the coffee shop and I get my latte, I can't help but see all the opportunity around me. I see all the different decor they have up with coffee signs, and I see that their serving trays are, eh, they could be better, right? The finish, they're dry, they're cracking. Coasters, coffee scoops, um, so many different opportunities to make uh, products for them. So it's really cool, just by stopping by a coffee shop, just because it was a change of scenery, that was my intent. Now I know a fellow entrepreneur and I see a, a ton of potential for future business. Now, I haven't pitched that to them yet. That hasn't been my point. My point is to go get my latte and get other work done. But when the opportunity arises, they know what I do. What do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna come to me and, and we'll make it happen. All right, the next story I wanna share with you. 2018, when I was first getting started with the CNC business, remember, I still had my day job at that time. I was searching for opportunities. I tried the Etsy thing. I tried locally. I tried, I tried everything, varying success. But a question that keep coming, kept coming back to my mind was, where are people buying their products to sell? I remember walking through Lowe's one day and being like, Lowe's doesn't make any of this stuff. And this was a light bulb moment to me. Like, how can I do that? Now, I know I'm not Lowe's, right? But how can I take that model and 
benefit from it? Like, how can I apply that to my business? I ended up thinking about Etsy a little bit differently. I started approaching Etsy shop owners that uh, were selling something already, selling something that they made. And then I would pitch them a similar, or a, a product that would accompany uh, what they were already selling. So it'd basically be an upsell. Let's say a jewelry owner or a jewelry maker wants to sell a jewelry dish. Well, the jewelry owner most likely isn't gonna make the jewelry dish, so you can make the jewelry dish, sell it to them at a wholesale rate, and you can sell a lot bigger volume than you could ever sell of those jewelry trays on, Etsy, on your own Etsy store. And so the biggest deal I ever landed ended up being uh, over $5,000 in wooden trays in a matter of a few months. So I approached this Etsy store that was selling um, customized soap dispensers. And this was the height of the COVID stuff. So soap dispensers and sanitizer like dishes were flying off the shelves, right? I noticed she was selling a wooden tray for the two dishes to, or for the two pumps to sit in. I realized that she was extremely busy. Maybe she, didn't, she couldn't keep up with demand. I didn't know, but I just reached out to her, said, hey, I'm a CNC woodworker. I can make your trays for you. I don't know if you need any help. Let me know. Come to find out she was having issues with her current supplier. They couldn't keep up with the demand. So she ended up hiring me. You know what would have happened if I would have taken that same tray and posted it to my Etsy store and tried to sell it? Um, well, I wouldn't be telling you the story, first of all. And second of all, I would have 4,800 and $84 less because I sold them for $16 a piece to her because I would end up selling one because there was a thousand other people selling them as standalones on Etsy and I would have just blended in. All right, so to recap, I'm gonna pull out the key things that you can focus on to develop your entrepreneurial eye. Number one is to be curious. Be curious about the things around you and how they work. Number two is to look and listen for people's pain points. Where are people struggling? Uh, what problems can you solve? Number three is to talk to other business owners and learn from each other. They don't have to be in the woodworking niche. It can be in any niche, any kind of business. And uh, it's great to collaborate and learn from one another. Number four is embrace failure and learn from it. I really don't think there is such thing as failing. There is, but not in the sense that everybody thinks. Like they're just learning experiences. And that's my approach that I took from the very beginning. Just learn from it, take what I learned and apply it to the next situation. Number five is to be patient and persistent. Patient in the sense that opportunities come at random times. I don't know how many times I've experienced this, but it can be the most random moment and a business opportunity pops up out of it. Be persistent and don't, just because you've been told no once, doesn't mean that's the end of it. Take what you learn from that, get better, and reapproach it either with that person or go to a, a similar person and try it again. Number six is to have an open mind and be willing to self-evaluate. Just because you think something is the way that it is necessarily doesn't mean that's the way it is. That could, man, that really could stir up some stuff. But have an open mind. Yes, there's some absolute truths in the world. That's not what I'm saying. But when it comes to business opportunities and ideas, have an open mind. Did you notice that I've never mentioned to do what other people are doing? I think we're way too quick to see what's working for other people and think that's gonna work for us. I was watching this Alex Hormozzi video the other day and he said it perfectly. Uh, I'll link it uh, to his channel down below in the description, but he said that if you simply just copy what someone else is doing, I'm not saying like copy and then like see what they're doing and improve it. But if you just simply copy someone, you're already settling for second place before you even get started and you'll never win. Um, they're doing, they're already doing their thing. You're not going to be able to do what they do. The world needs your eyes to be able to see problems that you can only see and that you can only solve. You have a special set of skills, whether you realize it or not, only you are you. So start being curious, do some self-reflection, figure out what stirs that hunger. What, like what drives you? What do you want to do? And open your eyes to the things that are around you and you will start seeing these opportunities that have been there all along. 
So first, let's take a look at these products. They're only different in one way. One has these falling leaves, that was our fall lantern, and the other one has snowflakes, which was our winter slash Christmas lantern. We made these lanterns the same exact way. They are both made out of a veneered MDF. They're both the same exact dimensions. They're eight by four by four, and they, they both come with the same LED lights in them. We offered two options for each lantern. We offered them unassembled where we would package up all the parts that you needed, send them to you, and you can assemble them yourself. And we offered an assembled version. We sold the unassembled ones for $23 and we sold the assembled ones for $30, both with free shipping. Before we go any further, I wanna tell you about my Etsy sales strategy. It's a little bit different and I've talked about it in other videos, but just to recap, I use Etsy seasonally. I don't have items in my shop year round. I wanna make seasonal items and sell them when people are looking for them. So for example, my fall lantern was released in the fall and my winter lantern was released in the winter. And so that way I know people are actively looking for these things this time of year, rather than just putting them up there in the shop and year round and hoping people buy my items there are a lot of people that have successful Etsy shops where that is their full-time business. But for me personally, I'm not interested in running a Etsy shop year-round full-time. But I do see value in leveraging Etsy's audience and traffic during these seasonal times of the year. So let's dive into the sales of each one of these lanterns individually. Let's start with the Leaves Lantern. I listed them on September 20th. I sold one lantern in September, I sold 21 of them in October, and I sold 65 of them in November. For the snowflakes, I listed them on November 22nd, kind of in response of the leaves doing well. I used all the same exact information, profile, advertising, which we'll talk a little bit here in a second, but I used all the same information and I figured that would translate to the snowflakes. Listed them on November 22nd, and I have sold a total of five of them. Three of them were in the same order. So remember, these are just Etsy sale numbers. This doesn't include my website. This doesn't include uh, word, word of mouth, in-person sales. This is just comparing Etsy sales between these two products. So with all that information, why the different results? Although I'm not exactly sure why the different results, I've got five things that I believe contributed or five things that are five things that I know of that contribute to sales on Etsy. But this is definitely more of an exploratory, more of an ideas because I really don't know why the stark contrast between the two. All right, so number one, let's start with the difference between them. Leaves versus snowflakes. The only thing I can think of here is people like leaves more than snowflakes or maybe the leaves are more unique than the snowflakes. In our design, we intentionally did not mask the leaves. We wanted the burn on the outside of the leaf to kind of give a fall feel, leaves changing colors. Now we intentionally masked off our snowflakes, which is a little more labor intensive, but we wanted a nice clean laser cut to where it looked nice and crisp. So maybe people prefer the burned look a little bit more. I don't know if that would have made a difference in the snowflakes if we would have done that. That just doesn't add up in my brain. One possibility, it could be that the market is so saturated with Christmas decor that the lantern didn't seem as unique in the Christmas decor category because there's so much Christmas decor out there. Rather than fall decor or leaf decor, it kind of fits a season rather than a specific holiday. So that could be a possibility too. There's just far less fall decor out there and this lantern stuck out in that category. All right, the second thing that I've thought of is Etsy is controlled by algorithms. So sales depend on whether Etsy serves up your listing or not to buyers. Now, the reason for algorithms is they're trying to match the best customer with the best product that they're more, most likely to buy. That's the way I understand it. All right, number three, another big part of Etsy that you may not realize is that you can pay to advertise on Etsy. And I think in order to stand out, this is kind of critical that you do. Now, I had the same advertising budget, which I believe was $25 a day. That seems like a lot, but you don't pay 
that was my max. You don't pay $25 a day. You pay how many times people click on it. So, but the same budget was set. So what that helps do is it helps you rank higher in those, in those algorithms and it helps you rank higher to be in the top of a search category. So there was no difference in the amount of money I was paying um, to advertise these. That's not what drove the traffic. All right, the fourth thing that I thought of is product pictures. Now, if you do any Etsy research and about successful Etsy shops, it is all about staging and taking good photos. And that's not just on Etsy, that's on websites, that's in any kind of advertising. We took a lot of pictures and tried to stage these lanterns the best that we could. And we tried to mimic them the same settings, trying to get the shadow to cast and that to stand out. I do think that the pictures are better on the leaves for whatever reason, the shape of the leaf and how it casts more light. I think that just looks better than the snowflake. But we retook the pictures and re-uploaded new pictures, new thumbnail pictures to Etsy for the snowflake at least four times and trying to change them out and try to get the best picture to attract people. And we didn't see a change in sales with any of those changes. All right, the fifth thing, I've already talked about it a little bit, but keywords and descriptions. Those are super important on Etsy and maybe we just didn't hit the right search terms. I actually started with the same tags that I had for the leaf lantern, but just changed the words from fall to winter or from, from Thanksgiving to Christmas. And that didn't work at all either. There could be something there and that kind of plays back into the algorithm. I just don't know if we were, I, we weren't ranking high enough in these search results or we weren't or I didn't use the right ones where people were searching. So I'm really curious to hear what you think the difference is between the two. I don't know if there's any right or wrong answer here, and there may be. If you're an Etsy expert, let me know. I would love, I would love to hear from you. But let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are, why one was so much more successful than the other. Like I said before, I do see the potential in Etsy, but it definitely isn't a set it and forget it, and I'm just gonna put my items up there and I'm gonna sell. Um, I, there's a lot of work and the people that are successful on Etsy put a ton of effort into being successful. As we can see from this example, it's hard to know whether an item is going to be successful or not on Etsy. And that's not something that I'm willing to bank my business on. In a recent poll here on my channel, I asked, does the fear of failure hold you back in your CNC business? And the results were really interesting. Over 60% of people said yes, they believe that fear holds them back in their CNC business. I've talked a lot about how to make things on your CNC and how to sell them and how to build a side hustle, how to build a business. But this poll made me realize there is one big thing that I have not talked about much, and that is self-doubt and the fear of public failure. Self-doubt and fear is something that affects all of us, myself included and it holds us back from reaching our full potential and reaching our goals. Now, this isn't a rah-rah speech, so don't go anywhere. This isn't a motivational speech that's here today and gone tomorrow. You can do it! I'm gonna give you some tangible things that you can do to overcome these obstacles so you can reach your goals faster. So five years ago, when I was starting my woodworking business, I was actively trying to find work. Uh, I wasn't even into CNC yet. I was doing more traditional products, building tables, uh, doing uh, different build out, typical standard power tools. And I still had my full-time job at the time. So I was actively trying to find work. One day I got a message from, I would say an acquaintance, uh, someone that I met uh, at a church function. And they said, hey, I've got a friend that is a woodworker uh, that's about 45 minutes away from you and they uh, have too much work and they're looking to subcontract some out. He put me in touch with the other woodworker and we started talking. So Jeremy said, hey, I got a project for you. I can't get to in time. The client needs it faster. And what it was, was it was two floating nightstands. Honestly, my skills weren't that good. They were probably better than I thought they were. I'd built and, and sold several small projects, but nothing like for someone else. That was nerve wracking uh, to, you know, I wasn't 
entirely confident in my skills. So this first job that he gave me was kind of my test run. So he sent me the drawings and I just had to build them to those drawings. So long story short, I ended up um, building these two. It took me forever. It, it took me like 20 hours to build these things. And all it was was like a box, right? This should have took a couple hours to build. Looking back on it now, I mean, it's completely ridiculous that it took me that long. But it was being, perfection, being a perfectionist, trying to make a good impression. But I'll be honest, a lot of it was just the fear of not knowing if it was gonna be good enough. Now, Jeremy is an excellent, excellent woodworker and still is to this day. And you know, the pressure of building up to his standards, I made sure like the smallest little detail like really, really stood out to me and kept me from progressing, right? So I doubted myself the entire time. I doubted my ability. So fast forward, I got them done, got the projects done. I drove 45 minutes to deliver them to Jeremy. And you know, the whole time I'm thinking like, oh gosh, he's gonna hate these things. We're just gonna throw them in the trash and he's gonna build them. Um, I just wasted his time, wasted my time, wasted my money. All those thoughts are going through my head. But we get there, I open the trunk, and uh, Jeremy looks at them and uh, like inspects them. And he's like, good job, they look great. I think the customer will love them. And I was like, really? Like I did not think it was gonna go that way at all. So the next day I got a text saying, client loved them, would you like another job? I was like, okay, sure, what are you thinking? So the jobs just started snowballing, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, the biggest job I ended up doing for Jeremy was a uh, entertainment center, full built-in entertainment center that we delivered to the client's house and installed. So one day he approached me with this project and if you've been around the channel for any amount of time, you know that I made a ton of these wooden cracker trays. And this is where that opportunity came from. So Jeremy was approached by a company called Harp Design Co, which is in Waco, Texas. So if you don't know who Harp Design Co is, uh, Clint Harp, the owner, along with his wife, uh, of that business is Chip and Joanna Gaines uh, Woodworker. And he is seen on the HGTV show Fixer Upper. So anytime Joanna needed a uh, table built for a remodel, Clint Harp is the one that would build it. And they wanted a, a custom designed cracker tray. So Jeremy doesn't have a CNC. So he turned to me and said, hey Andy, can you make something like this? And I said, sure. So we ended up selling over 700 of these cracker trays to them uh, that they sold in their retail store and online. And we also made several other projects. It started with the cracker trays and then it just expanded out from there. They were always looking for unique custom items for their shops. So let me put it this way. I almost let fear and self-doubt keep me from building two floating nightstands that I lost money on but led to designing and selling thousands of dollars of CNC products to someone that stands on the shoulders of Chip and Joanna Gaines. As Andrew, my video editor said when we were planning this video, he said that the fear of failure keeps you from starting and self-doubt creeps in when you've already started and stops or slows progress. And this is so true in my story that I just shared. I necessarily didn't have the fear of failure of starting. I, I think I was okay with jumping in uh, but self-doubt was huge and that's what slowed everything down. It took 10 times longer than it should have. I eventually got to my goal, but self-doubt was a real battle there. So why do I call it the fear of public failure? Because most of us, I think, are okay with failing privately. Yes, we may be disappointed, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we're not embarrassed. And I think that's a key difference there. When we put something out to the public, that is much more intimidating and uh, generates a fear because we don't know how people are going to respond. Fear and doubt leads to hesitation. So how can we overcome these fears and doubts uh, so we don't hesitate? So number one, we need to be able to recognize it in ourselves. Obviously, if we don't recognize these things in ourselves, uh, we can't do anything about it. And the sneaky thing about about fear and about doubt is that a lot of it is subconscious and it's sneaky. So here are some common ways that you may see fear and doubt creep up in you. You know, you're hesitant to post a picture to social media of a project for X, Y, and Z reason. You just can't hit that post button 
Or maybe you can't sign up, for, you hesitate to sign up for a craft show. You know, maybe you don't think your products are good enough. Maybe you just, you're just overwhelmed and you just don't know what to do. Or maybe you're just hesitant to operate your CNC. Maybe every time you started a project, you broke something or it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. And you just, you doubt your abilities. So maybe you identify with one of those hesitations. What can we do to overcome that hesitation, right? We've identified it now. How can we overcome it? And I think the first thing we need to do is accept that failure isn't the end. Failure is simply a stepping stone to success. And when we take that, when we have that mind shift of, oh, it's, it's just starting again um, with knowledge rather than the end, it is freeing. And you take those mistakes and you stack them on top of each other. And that is what equals success. That's how you reach your goals is by failing. All right, so maybe we've gotten to the point now where we can accept failure and that uh, keeps us um, from, from being stuck. It, it unsticks us and gets us going. Now, what is the best way to fail? The best way to fail is to fail on small projects or fail, fail small is what I like to call it. And that may be on a shrunk down version of a project that may be just simply trying a new tool path on a blank piece of MDF. Um, but fail small rather than failing big. This goes back to also failing privately instead of failing publicly. Get your failures uh, done early. You know, failing earlier in the process is better than failing later in the process. Maybe if you're scared to break bits on your CNC, you can do an air pass. Um, where you set your Z height, uh, you know, three inches above your work surface. So your bit doesn't even engage with your material. And that way it can go around. It doesn't cut anything. You're like, okay, well now I can get a little closer or a little deeper. And then it goes and it goes around and that's a success. And then, you know, then you get to the actual Z depth and cut your project out. So small steps, failing small, um, to build momentum. So while you're going through this failing small process, it's really important to surround yourself with people that want to see you succeed. So for me personally, I attribute my success to the people that are around me that want to see me succeed. The people around me have had a massive impact on the things that I've accomplished. So once we have people that want to see us succeed around us, it's really important that we ask them and listen for constructive feedback, right? So this is where we go from failing privately to failing publicly, uh, right? We built this, these people around us that want to see us succeed, give us positive feedback. So it's really important that we only care what the people that want to see us succeed think and our target audience thinks. We don't care about what anybody else outside of that uh, thinks. That's just going to hold us back. So one really important aspect that we need to consider is our why. Why do we want to make things and sell things with our CNC? Is it uh, money? Is it uh, a creative outlet? Is it success, a successful business? Or is it something like praise? You want that feedback. You want people to be like, wow, you, you're really good at that. All of these reasons are perfectly fine. We may think of them as negative things, but these are great motivations. We need to figure out our why. So what is the difference between people that achieve success and people that don't achieve success, that are unsuccessful? And when I say successful and unsuccessful, I'm talking about their personal, their why, right? What they set out to do. Um, do they achieve it or don't they achieve it? This isn't an umbrella like you're a success or failure. This is a personal thing. So the thing is, is everybody on the face of the earth faces the fear of failure, the feel of public failure and self doubt. And I believe that the difference between people that succeed and people that don't is that those who succeed embrace the feeling of fear and do it anyway. Recently, I was facing a bout of uncertainty in my business and scrolling through Instagram one day, I found this post and at that moment in time, it couldn't have been more true in my life. Do what you love and you'll work super hard all the time with no separation or any boundaries, and also take everything extremely 
personally. All right, so that's a little dramatic for me, but at that moment in time, it hit me square. And I believe that I'm not the only one. I believe that this is the reality for new business owners at some point, maybe not all the time, but there are times where this is true for everyone. See, as small business owners, we feel like we need to take on everything and anything in order to make this thing that we created succeed. Oftentimes, this comes at the expense of our health, our relationships, and even our overall happiness, which is the reason we started this whole thing in the first place. But does it have to be that way, or is there another way? Well, I believe that there is another way. Before I share that with you though, let's look at five reasons businesses fail. There's a million reasons out there, but these are five reasons that I find personal to me and something that I have struggled with from time to time or have faced from time to time. All right, the first one is trying to do everything themselves. Yep, that's me. Number two is too much debt. I've been fortunate enough to avoid this one, but this is a pitfall for a lot of people. Number three is no business plan throwing paint at the wall and hoping it sticks with no real plan. Number four is similar, but it's not setting specific goals. That way you have nothing to work towards. So if you're not aiming for something, you're gonna hit nothing. Number five, refusing to pivot and adapt. The business five years ago most likely won't look like the business five years from now. It's obvious, but I feel like I need to say it. Being hardworking and dedicated to your business, whether that's a side hustle that you're just starting or something that you wanna work and into that is full time, there's no way around hard work and dedication. But with that being said, being hardworking and dedicated isn't enough alone. So Andy, how can you say that? I just need to strap up my boots and go to work every day. That's true, but if that's all you do, success is gonna be hard to find. How do I know this? There are a lot of failed businesses that had really hardworking and really dedicated people that are no longer in business. So what should we do to give our CNC businesses the greatest chance of success? We need to surround ourselves with A, people that have already traveled the road before us, and B, people that are currently on the road with the same goals as us. Let me say that again. We need to find people that have traveled the road before us, and find people that are currently on the road with us. Now, I'm not talking about befriending people just simply to get ahead, but I'm talking about people that are currently in the trenches doing what you're doing or are just ahead of you and have done what you are wanting to do, building a community of those people that this common bond, this common trust where you can link arms and lift each other up. Now, the common thought is, well, why would I why would someone else give me information? I'm going to be competition to them and uh, why, they're not going to do that or people aren't going to be willing to help me. They're too busy. And that is a lie. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. People that are successful realize that it takes other people to surround themselves with, to lift each other up and to raise the bar. Now, obviously there's some information that probably shouldn't be shared. There's some things, some proprietary things that shouldn't be shared. I get that. But when it comes to support, encouraging, pointing things out, and lifting each other up, this can be done without sharing that information. Let me give you an example. How is it that professional athletes train together in the off season? Meaning an athlete that com usually competes against that person, in the off season, they get together, they're friends, they lift each other up, and they work out together to get better. Why would they do that when they're competitors? Well, the reason is, is because they realize that doing that, doing it with other people will raise their level, it'll raise both of their games. So if it's worth it to these highly competitive athletes, shouldn't it be worth it to us? Shouldn't we get together with like-minded people and learn from one another and raise both of our games at the same time? So having other people around me has been critical to the success of my business. I owe an awful lot to a lot of different people that have helped me out along the way. Yes, I've had to be dedicated and put in the hard work and hours and make it happen on my own, but I've had a lot of people that have helped me point out possible things that I could do better, things that uh, I should stop doing, um, just encouraging me. This is why I've created a new exclusive community for CNC business owners or prospective CNC business owners called 
the Desktop CNC Inner Circle. In this group, you'll have unlimited access to me to ask questions and get advice. You'll be a part of a community of people that are like you, on the same road as you, and that are trying to figure out this CNC business thing. In this community, we'll share our wins, our losses, we'll learn from one another, and encourage one another. Whether you have been making and selling things for 10 years with your CNC, or you haven't even purchased a CNC yet, this group is for you. This collaborative approach to owning a CNC business will shorten the time for you to see success. If this sounds interesting to you, I'll leave a link in the video description right below here for you to click on and check out to get more information. Starting and running a business is hard. Why try to do it by yourself? The best thing that you can do is surround yourself with people that are trying to do the same thing and people that have traveled the road before you that are ahead of you. Whether that is the inner circle CNC group or it's some other group that you find, the number one thing you can do is surround yourself with those people. So I challenge you to do this. If you are trying to do this whole side hustle or business thing with your CNC alone and you, you find yourself not having contact, someone that you can ask questions, seek these people out and find them. And I promise you it'll be well worth the effort the five steps that we're gonna be talking about today are define, develop, produce, test, and bring to market. So let's start with define. So when we're defining a product, this is the idea stage. This is where we brainstorm and where we sketch. So this step may seem obvious to you, but hear me out. This step is extremely important because it starts the iteration process. So what do I mean by starting the iteration process? So an iteration is improving on what you've done previously. So getting better, refining every time. And so if you start just with a sketch or if you can refine a couple refinements in, in your head and then a couple refinements, a couple iterations on paper, by the time you get down the line, you've already done four or five iterations on your product rather than just jumping to the end spending a lot of time in CAD CAM work, spending a lot of time designing just to have to go through those iterations. So you might as well get them done early and take the time early. So recently I have been going through this process with one of my own products, which is a map to document where we've traveled as a family. So I started thinking through this process, like I said, while I was driving. So I was able to get a lot of things thought about. We had a lot of time to think while we were driving. So. Uh, I came up with this idea, almost looks like a, like a kid's puzzle. So I want it to hang on the wall. I want it to be easy enough where my son can glue or keep track of the states himself. So it came back to, so I came up with like this kid puzzle idea where I cut out the states um, and then I cut the state map. We glue the wooden states into the map and they're colorful. It's kind of kids themed, right? And hang on his wall. I'll share a little bit more about it on the next steps. Um, kind of as an example, as I've progressed through. So let's move to the next one, which is develop. So the develop stage consists of two primary things. One is doing a little bit of market research. And the second is material, sourcing material. I can't tell you how often sourcing material is overlooked and it can break a project. You can have a great idea and move down the line. And next thing you know, you can't, if you can't source the material, if you can't source it consistently, then your hands are tied. So you need to make sure that you have uh, access to the materials that you're gonna use. While performing some brief market research, be looking for things like price point, uh, competition, is there anything else that, else out there like this? Uh, and where is your audience? Where are you gonna sell this? Thinking about those three things before you ever develop or before you ever create a product is so key. Now, you don't need to spend a ton of time here. You don't need to nail these things down, but you do need a rough idea before you move forward into the production stage. When it comes to price range, it's a range. So come up with a low and a high. You're kind of looking at what the market will bear. Now, are, and then you can gauge whether you're creating a high-end product and you want to fall at the top of the market, or you can beat people on price if you're creating a similar product you can fall at the bottom of it. So establishing that range is really important at this point. When you're looking for any of this market research, just do a simple Google search. Take your idea, put it in Google and see what comes up. So this is the first critical crossroads in this process. You have your market research, you have your range, you have your materials. Kind of with all that information, you have to ask yourself at this point, 
Does this make sense? Consider all that information, ask yourself, be honest with yourself, is this still a viable option? If it is, move forward. If it isn't, refine and ask yourself the question again. Back to the story about my kids travel map. So when I took that idea to the develop phase, materials. I was like, okay, plywood makes sense for the base, except the edge. Um, it'll make sense uh, for the pockets uh, where the states fit into because you won't be able to see the plywood. So I was thinking, okay, plywood works as long as I can make the edge look good. And then the states. The states I would want to make, um, I could make out of plywood as well. I kind of want them to stick up like a quarter of an inch. So then I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just go with a, a pine or a poplar or something like that. The next thought was, what kind of finish am I going to put on this? So I just wanted a natural wood finish for the base, but for the states, since it was going to be kids, I wanted to paint the state different colors. It was the idea I had. Painting is time consuming and especially painting states different colors. So I was thinking through all these processes and then I did a Google search. Is there anything out there like this? Well, obviously there's kids puzzles. I didn't find anything marketed just as I was thinking about as a uh, travel map for kids to keep track of where they've traveled. So after gathering this information, I, I came up with the price point of low end $50, high end $100. I think uh, people are willing to spend money on this as a gift. And especially if I personalize it um, with a name or something like that, I think uh, I could get upwards of that $100, $90, $85, somewhere in there. So where's my customer? This is extremely important. Now for this one, my first gut instinct was Etsy all day long. Etsy is great for gifts, great for personalized things, for kids. Typically my go-to isn't Etsy, but for this particular item, I think it would do very well on Etsy. So asking myself the question that I just asked you to ask yourself, does this all make sense? I've got my idea, my design idea kind of fleshed out. I've got my rough information. I decided to move forward. I think I felt good enough about the information I had that I could hit that price point and make these. The only question mark was is whether I, whether I was going to paint the wooden pieces or not, because again, there's a lot of labor costs there. And so that is going to be a little bit of a trial. But with all that information, I felt good enough to move forward to the production stage. In this stage is where we start getting into our CAD CAM work. We've got to come up with the CAD file so we can apply our tool paths and actually produce, physically produce the item that we're making. So some things to think about here is tool path optimization. How many tool changes? How many, uh, you know, your feeds and speeds, material, your work holding, thinking about all those different things. Um, and that is part of developing a new product because every setup is different. And uh, so fleshing these things out and optimizing them, uh, your first run is probably not going to be your most efficient and that's okay. So, but just take that information and learn and build upon it. For me, this is where the travel map is currently stalled. I spent a couple hours trying to get the files prepared, the CAD work, so the design work, the SVGs and DXF files, to work the way and to look the way that I wanted them to. One of the main problems that put this project on hold, I'm still gonna continue it, but one of them that put it on hold is that I was trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, meaning the pockets that the states fit into, have their corners have a, a quarter inch radius on them. They have the same radius as the end mill does. And then when you're cutting the states, uh, they're cutting the outside and those are 90 degree angles. So when you're trying to fit that state into that hole, it doesn't work. Once I have that all figured out, I will be creating my first prototype and that is the next step here, is getting all that CAD cam work figured out and creating your first prototype. So the next phase is where we test our product out. We probably don't need to do like industrial testing and stress testing, I mean, I guess, it depends what you're creating. But this is more, this is where you start iterating on the physical thing. So you made it, you can see it. Is it what you pictured in the define stage? So this is where you'll bounce back and forth a couple times, a few times, sometimes a lot of times uh, from the test to the produce phase. And this is where you make improvements and get your product ready to be launched. You refine everything. And now we're ready to bring it to market. 
that market research that we did earlier is really gonna help us here, so let's build upon that. Places that you identified where your customers will be is the first place you need to go. The other thing that you need to do is establish your final price. So this is a lot easier decision now than it is at the beginning, because now you have all that information, you know the exact material, you know the exact time, and you know your exact overhead cost and your advertising cost, you know all that. And you don't need to know specifically that at the beginning. But now, with all that information, you can make that decision. So in the intro, I talked about the number one thing that you need to do in order to see success selling the things that you make. And so here it goes. The number one thing you need to do is match your product to your audience. I cannot, if you don't get anything else out of this video, matching your product to your audience is so, so critical. I stumbled through this for two years, creating products randomly and po just posting them on Etsy or my website where I just created things that I thought was cool and I didn't do well at all. I sold an item here, I sold an item there. And so what I learned from that is creating a product for someone specifically the more specific you can get about that person and know where they're at, the easier it will be to sell and the more success you will you'll see. If you're trying to sell your items hard, like like really, really it's really hard to sell your items, like you have feel like you have to convince people, then you're not creating a product for a specific person. I, I think of like telemarketers. Think about how hard they work for a sale. Think about people that go door to door and knocking on doors and they have to sell so hard because they're selling to people that most likely don't want, like they don't need their product. They're not interested in it. So if you can get your product in front of the people that you created it for, you will see so much more success. All right, end of soapbox, but I'm really passionate about that because I wanna see your efforts yield results. Like no one wants to waste their time creating something that doesn't sell. All right, the first way not to get more customers is coming up with a business name. It's really common to think that you need to come up with a business name in order to sell the things that you make. And that's not true at all. There is a lot of time wasted on coming up with the perfect business name. And I'm not saying that that's not important down the road. Actually, a lot of these things that I'm gonna share are important at some point. But when you're first getting started and trying to attract more customers, coming up with a business name really isn't gonna help you all that much. The next way to not get more customers is by building a website, especially if you're building a website too early. And a website is important, again, at some point. But if you have zero customers and you are trying to attract customers, building a website is not going to get you more customers. Uh, it's gonna be very time consuming and it can be expensive, but you're gonna put money to it and the return on that, you're not gonna be happy with, especially when there's social media these days a website is something that is further down the road. All right, number three is trying to come up with the perfect idea or the perfect product. Everything that I've made and sold is the result of something that I made. You're gonna learn the most by actually making that idea that you have. In most cases, an idea in your head is not going to attract more customers, but by making something and iterating on it and improving on it, and showing people it, that is going to gain interest because people can actually see what you made. All right, number four, although I wish this one was true, is spending money on tools. Now, buying necessary tools obviously is necessary, it's important. But if you think buying that bigger shop or that better tool, or I just need this, is going to bring you more customers, you're wrong. Now, buying tools and upgrading tools is a part of growing a business, and it may enable you to serve more customers, but those aren't gonna bring in new customers. The fifth way not to attract more customers is by simply looking around and watching what everybody else is doing. It is beneficial to observe and look and see what your competition is doing, but we can get stuck in that place where we're just looking at what everybody else is doing and we're not actually doing anything ourselves. Today's video is sponsored by the CNC Inner Circle. It's an exclusive group for CNC business owners that all have one goal in common. They wanna make money with their CNC. But just don't take my word for it. Listen to what longtime members Drew and Zach 
have to say about the CNC inner circle. Hello, my name is Drew Carpenter. I own a small woodworking business that's been operating for about three years now, right outside of uh, Winfield, West Virginia. The main thing I like about being in this group is everyone's has the same like-minded goal to be able to to push themselves to to try to get new products out there, to try to get things to make it more efficient, to try to just grow. You want to be able to surround yourself with people that have like-minded goals, and that's really the key to being able to grow. Um, people that's taken that step along with you, that it just makes you uh, feel a lot more confident around, um, you know, to be able to speak your mind about things that you want to try or just he being able to hear other people's experience that they got to win. It, it's motivating to be able to to use that to to try to move your yourself forward. Hi, I'm Zach with Lumberzack Woodworking. I joined Andy's CNC Inner Circle as soon as it became available as I'd had a CNC in the past and never did anything with it. I'd ordered a new modern CNC and as soon as the group found out that I had one sitting on the shelf while I was waiting for this one to show up, they encouraged me to get it out. They helped me work through software, they helped me figure out how to get things working, we made some interesting projects. Uh, they've really been an encouragement and the wealth of knowledge that we share and the meetings that we have where we get together and just talk about CNC and life is great. Now, this is a paid group. The cost is $27 a month, but this is an exclusive group and you have access to all of my digital files, all of my guides, and I post exclusive content in there weekly and you're supporting what I do to help me continue to do what I do and create this content. So if you're a CNC owner and wanna make money with your CNC, check out the link in the description below for more details. All right, so now let's look at five ways you can get more customers. The number one way that you can get more customers is by making a product for a niche. Now, this might sound counterproductive, but hear me out. I've learned this lesson over and over and over again. If you try to appeal to everyone, you'll end up appealing to no one. Especially when you're getting started, it's really important to niche down. Now, as you grow, you can get wider and wider and wider. You can attract more people. But if you try to start up here at the funnel, you're just gonna get lost in that mix. There's so many people up there and the people that are up there have a stronger brand than you and that have a more powerful product than you and you're just gonna get dominated. So you gotta get down here towards the bottom of the funnel where you can, there's a smaller sample size of people, but you can appeal directly to them. They have an interest and their interests are more focused. All right, number two is look for problems to solve. Almost every business, it doesn't matter what industry they're in, is in business to solve a problem. So if you find a problem, a pain point, in the niche that you're in, you will automatically be pushed to the front because people want their problem solved. All right, the next way to get more customers is to lead with value. So many times, I'm guilty of this, we think in terms of what am I going to get out of this? And that is the wrong way to think about it. Yes, you are gonna get paid. Yes, we have to think about price and time we have into it. But when you're trying to attract new customers, lead with value. Offer something for free. Offer something for a discounted rate. Uh, go above and beyond of what is expected and the value that comes back to you, it will return. So lead with value and more customers will come. All right, number four is letting people know what you do. If you are a woodworker in your garage uh, and you don't share it with anybody, but you wanna sell products, no one knows what you have for sale if you don't tell them. No one knows what you do if you don't tell them. When people know what you do and either they have a need themselves, they'd be like, oh, so-and-so does this. I'm gonna ask them. Or uh, a friend hears of, of, of another friend that needs a table built or needs some business consulting or whatever it may be, people know what you can do and refer them to you. The fifth way to get more customers is by building a portfolio. Traditionally, this was done on a website or even more traditionally, this was done in a book. But today, we can use social media. There are a lot of different ways to use social media, but I recommend starting a page just to take, if nothing else, just take finished shots 
of the work that you create. What this does is it's not even necessarily for the people that are on social media to see it. But when you come across somebody in public or someone contacts you, you can send them to your social media page and they can see all the work that you've done. It's a really powerful tool. It gives you a lot of credibility and it really shows your ability right away. To whereas if someone comes to you and they just know you're a woodworker, they don't know what you're capable of and they don't know what you build. So it automatically gets, gets you over that big hurdle because people want to picture what you can do and picture what you can do for them. So about two months ago now, a company reached out to me after seeing one of my Instagram posts. They reached out through Instagram, DM'd me, and asked if I would be interested at looking into manufacturing their products. They currently get them manufactured overseas. And since I talk a lot about making stuff wholesale, I guess that's where they found me and just wanted to explore it. So initially when they asked me uh, what I typically do like structure wise, price wise for wholesale deals. And I usually start at 50% of the retail value. It's kind of a standard thing that I've always done. Now I've done less than that and I've done more than that, but my starting point is 50%. Well, they kind of balked at that and said that, that there's no way that that was possible. And then I went back and said, well, what is possible? And back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So come to find out they were having some issues with getting fulfillment from overseas. And that makes sense because I don't know if you've heard anything, but obviously the supply chain was disrupted and lead times on getting products from overseas were really, really long and shipping costs went way, way up. So that's what they were trying to circumvent by bringing manufacturing over here. They were trying to figure out if this was even possible. And these are this, the initial questions that I asked. And I said, what kind of volume? And they said, uh, 2000 to 10,000 units per month kind of blew me away a little bit like whoa so after I actually saw the product we figured out the volume I was a little hesitant on the volume they were a little hesitant on the pricing model and so talks went cold fast forward to two weeks ago now the same company reached out to me and said hey we're getting ready to place a large order and we're just wanted to revisit this and see uh, if we could work anything out so the second time they reached out they said what about doing 2,000 units uh, initially, and then 600 a month after that. And I start, started to think, okay, well, that's, I, I could, 2000 a lot, but I could figure it out. But they came back and they said, hey, we need them for $10 a piece, and that is shipped to our warehouse in Texas. And I was like, 10 times 2000 is 20000 I was like, that's a lot of money. And then $6,000 a month after that? Okay. But then, I remembered the numbers that I crunched. I'd have two to four dollars into building one of these in materials alone. I would have about the same into labor. And that's a little bit of an unknown as well because I don't know how far I can scale these and what kind of efficiencies I can get to. So let's just say we're at, let's split the difference, say three dollars for materials, three dollars for labor. And then I have to ship them to Texas. I'm in Kentucky. so. There is not enough meat on the bone at $10. Just roughly looking into those estimates, like, yeah, it's just not possible. And I didn't slam the door. The door is still open eventually. Maybe there's another product that they need that, you know, I can do more efficiently or I do know more about. This tray right here, could it be done on my CNC? Yes. Could it be done more efficiently other ways? I think so. For hypothetical reasons, let's just say I we negotiated a price and it was $20 a piece. That might be high for you, that might be low for you, that's not the point. The point is, is that we came to an agreement. The question then becomes, okay, how am I going to get this done and what is it gonna take, right? Well, something at this scale would literally take all my time initially. I would have to stop creating YouTube videos. I'd have to put other projects to the side. I already have other obligations that I have to meet um, business-wise. So you have to ask yourself, uh, okay, the price is good. We agree on the price. How am I going to get this done? Like I said before, this involves either contracting it out to another uh, woodworker or hiring employees. And that also means investment on my part. Even if we could agree on price, is it something that I want to do? Is it worth the money? And those are all questions that you, you have to ask yourself. Is this something I want to do? Is this going to take me 
where I want to go? Is this going to help me further what I'm trying to do? Because it's really easy to see the dollar signs and the dollar signs might be enough and that's okay. But it's really easy to see that dollar signs, especially when you've been striving and trying to get jobs and this job comes along and you're like, oh yes, I made it. It's, it, it's such a big job. And hopefully you do the numbers ahead of time and realize, oh, I'm not gonna make money on that. Rather than doing, just saying yes to it and then doing the numbers afterwards and being like, wow, I didn't make any money on that. I did all that work and didn't make any money and everybody else made money. Overall, this was a great reminder of it's really important to figure out what you want to do and what your goals are and to be real with yourself of what you're currently capable of. If I would have said yes to this job, I would have been making everybody else money and I wouldn't have been making any money myself. Actually, it would have cost me money to make this order. I wouldn't have been making $20,000. I would have been making other people a portion of that $20,000. The lumber supplier gets paid, the, uh, the finish I use, they get paid, the employees that I would use get paid, and the purchaser of the product is gonna get paid. Just because you have work does not mean you're making money. You need to remember that you need to be making money too. After all, you're the one creating the product. Five years ago now, when I started woodworking as a side hustle, I had zero idea how much social media would impact my business. But at that time, before Andy Bird Builds and before selling uh, woodworking projects, before any of that, my social media presence was Facebook to keep in touch with family and friends. And I had a Twitter that I used to keep in touch with colleagues with my previous career that has zero to do with what I do now. But standing where I'm at today, I can literally say that social media has had over a hundred thousand dollar impact on Andy Bird builds and and that is taking out what YouTube has paid me directly with YouTube AdSense. Now I think that's important for this video because I want to show I want to focus on how social media ha can impact a woodworking business, a woodworking side hustle, not a content creation business. So you're probably thinking, well, what's involved? What does that $100,000 number represent? Well, it represents kind of be summed up into two things. And those two are relationships and sales. Now, I have found in my experience that those two things go hand in hand. They're very interconnected. Social media is all about connecting people together with common interests and common goals. So what I'm about to say isn't anything new. Uh, people have always been connecting over shared interests and shared goals. It just looked a little different before social media. So when I was thinking about this, this is what I pictured. Think about the small rural town with a small family restaurant or diner where people that lived in that area, they would gather there, let's say every morning or every Saturday morning, the same coffee table, sipping on coffee, talking about the weather, talking about current events, um, but also sharing how business has been, what they've been working on. Uh, and this is before the internet. I know that for a lot of you, I'm sure that's hard to remember. For some of you, it probably isn't. But that's how they gathered. That's how they came together and shared. Now, everybody knew everybody and they all gathered together and would share and uh, collaborate together. And if you needed something, one of those things, you went to those people. A much simpler time than now. All right, so with that picture in mind, what does that look like today with the internet and social media? And how can social media um, help us here. We get to sit at the table, sipping our cup of coffee, sharing our interests, talking about our goals and how we can help one another. But rather than just doing it locally, now we can do it with people all over the world from different corners of the world. Now that's pretty cool. My first big break in my woodworking business came on Facebook. I had been posting my projects on my personal Facebook page for a while and just to share what I had been doing. Uh, with no real purpose of promoting anything. It wasn't Facebook Marketplace, or I wasn't trying to sell anything, nor, I think it's important to know, I wasn't trying to become an influencer. I wasn't posting for likes or comments or algorithms. Uh, it was just simply to share what I was doing. So one of my Facebook friends saw what I had been doing, and they had a friend, a Facebook friend, 
who was looking for some help in their woodworking business. He put two and two together and put us in touch with one another. That simple connection has had a massive impact on my business, both relationally and financially. Jeremy and I are still really good friends to this day, and we share work back and forth with one another all the time. The original work that Jeremy needed help with was some custom CNC work for a client that has been featured on HGTV. And we still work with that client today. Jeremy is an excellent furniture builder and I have the CNC router and CNC laser services. So our services complement each other very, very well. The point here being if Jeremy and I didn't post what we were doing and what we had working on, on our personal social media pages, we wouldn't know each other existed. We would live within 30 miles of each other and just not know each other existed. Can you imagine how different our businesses would be today if we didn't make that connection? So this raises the question, who has similar goals as you that is in close proximity to you that you don't know about? And where if that connection was just made, both of your businesses would flourish. When you are posting to social media, be sure to tag your location. You can do this in two ways. One, you can physically check in or tag your location depending on the platform that you're posting on. But two, make sure you use local geographical uh, hashtags. I live in Kentucky, so hashtag Kentucky. Um, if I lived in Austin, Texas, hashtag Austin, Texas, or checking in or tagging those locations. Now, you can even get more specific and go hashtag Austin, woodworking or Austin, Texas woodworking or things like that. Now this is a fantastic way to boost your discoverability so people can find you and you can make those connections. Over the years I've had numerous, whether it's individuals or businesses, reach out to me to see if I could make a product for them. All through social media. Now this isn't me marketing to them, this isn't me trying to reach out to them, this is just simply me posting on social media what I have been doing, what I can do, and them coming and saying, hey, can you do this? So becoming a social media influencer is kind of the only way social media is thought of from the woodworker side. So it's really common to think, why would I post on social media if I'm not going to get, if I'm not gonna be an influencer, if I'm not gonna get the likes, and if the algorithm isn't gonna serve me up. That's a lot of people's goal, and that's fine. But that is not the goal for everyone but there is still tremendous value in posting on social media. Think about it as building a portfolio of your work where you can utilize that portfolio down the road. Now, people used to build three ring binder portfolios and take them to clients and show them what their company was capable of. People use websites as portfolios, uh, but the reason social media is so powerful to use as building a portfolio, one, it is searchable and discoverable by people that you don't know, but two, it's absolutely free. So building portfolio by posting on social media accomplishes these three things. Number one, it gets you discovered. People need to know what you do. Number two, you're demonstrating your capability. People need to know what is possible, what you're capable of. And number three, it builds credibility over time. People need to be able to trust that you can do what you say you can do. And you do that over the long haul by consistently posting and consistently showing what you can do and consistently showing growth as well. That's why I highly recommend you start as soon as possible. So don't make the mistake by waiting to post until your product is absolutely perfect. There may be a place for that on direct marketing, but when you're first starting out, the process of improvement is really valuable to show people. Say, hey, my company started here and now we're here. There is great power in that. So whether your client is another business or whether it's an individual, you need to establish these three things in order to be successful. One time I had a local barware company reach out to me and ask if I could make these custom bar signs. I'll leave a link down in the description. Um, this was three years ago or so. But anyways, I did a video on making those bar signs. This was a local company who sells online and was looking to get into the decor um, space. They sold barware, they wanted to get into bar decor. The thought here was to make uh, standard designs, standard layouts, 10 different designs with different emblems, and then the only part that was customizable was the name at the top. So it would just be doing a, uh, a last name, and it was so-and-so's bar with logos on it. That was the idea in a nutshell. I made 10 prototypes, sent them to them, 
Um, we started selling online. We sold a few. We didn't sell a ton because I quickly realized that it was just more than my business could handle at the time. I was in a completely different place than I was now. But the point here is that that whole thing came through Instagram. They messaged me on Instagram and found me on Instagram, saw the work, saw the CNC work that I had been doing. Unfortunately, that exact deal didn't work out, but I learned so much from that experience and really learned what was possible and not possible. Another time I had a client reach out through Facebook wanting a walk-in pantry build out with adjustable shelving and countertops. And this was er in the early days of my woodworking business where I was taking any and all projects, not just CNC projects. And, but they reached out after they had saw the build out that, that I did in my own house of our walk-in pantry. They, I was just posting final pictures, prog progress pictures, wasn't advertising at all about, hey, I can do this for you, but they reached out. I had a couple other people reach out too for that same exact thing. And so I did a closet build out just from posting on social media. I could go on and on about all the examples of work that has come to me. Uh, some of it I've said no to, some of it I said yes to. Some of it I've hasn't been work at all, it's just been relationships. Um, and then those relationships grow into work. And so it really got to think about it as like you're building out your web here. All the, you don't know how these connections are going to be made, but you're building out all these different connection, all these different potential connections, and they'll be linked together down the road. And so that's the way I think about it is social media is a free way to market yourself in a very powerful way. So if you haven't, no matter what the stage of your woodworking business is, start documenting your work on social media. Pick a platform. It doesn't even matter which platform. We could argue which one's the best, um, but pick a platform and start building a portfolio of work. The sooner you do this, the better off you will be down the road. A year, two years, three years down the road, you will be thankful that you started now. All right, number one, I've invested money into things that have made me money. I can't tell you how critical this is to my success. I see all the shops out there. There's some beautiful shops. I want all the tools myself, um, but it's really critical to, that I prioritize in buying things, investing into my shop and things that return monetarily. Now there's a lot of things that go into that. Everything can make you money. Everything can save you time, but prioritizing a list from top to bottom. Um, I've upgraded the Z axis to the HDZ. I've purchased the bit setter. Other than that, it's a completely stock machine, the Shaboko XXL. Number two, designing items that are easily replicable. What I mean by that is I try to specialize not in individual custom orders with V carving and stuff like that. I want to design myself unique and custom items and learn how to replicate them. It's a trade-off. You can get more money for individually custom items, but you can't produce as many of them. So my goal was to find sales channels where I could create unique products on a higher volume scale. So I had to ask myself, is the time for completely custom individual pieces worth the payoff? And for me, it wasn't. I can make more money and sell more items when I design and produce and replicate a particular item. All right, number three, I have all my layouts for the CNC machine exactly the same for a particular item. So I mill those items down to a certain size. So then it's just plug and play. It, or each piece is a certain size. So I don't have to re-zero anything in between pieces. So I know exactly how many items I can get from a certain size piece of stock. Number four, which is kind of like 3A, but is super important, is milling stock ahead of time. So I usually buy rough cut lumber and I mill it down myself to my certain dimensions, like I mentioned, but I do that ahead of time. So before I have an order, I'll have stock in, in piles ready for my next order. Now I recently started buying stock that's already milled, a little more expensive, but it takes less time. So there is a balance there. Another thing that I like to do is mill stock for the next day. What I mean by that is if I run through all my stock at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do in the morning is mill more stock to get the CNC running. 
So I like to have at least a few pieces, maybe an hour worth of cut time to keep the machine rolling. Number five is dialing in feeds and speeds. Now, like I said at the beginning of this, I am no expert. Some people watching this are gonna have a lot more experience than I do. So I have my speeds for my certain items dialed in now and they're ever evolving. One thing I like to do with feeds and speeds is a roughing pass and then a finishing pass, especially on my wooden trays. This limits the amount of sanding I need to do down the line. So I'll do a roughing pass at a faster, larger step over, and then I'll leave about a sixteenth of an inch for a finishing pass, and I'll tighten the step over to like 0.04. And that gives me a very, very smooth finish and very limited hand sanding on these trays. All right, number six. Something that I think is easily overlooked is having adequate dust collection. Now, my dust collection system is always a work in progress. Actually, last week I modified it again to make it better. But having shop vacs, having a central dust collection system, um, having enclosure, um, and having some way to keep that clean is super important. All right, number seven is having backup CNC parts and end mills. I think this is an easy one to overlook too. Uh, but if you have a V-wheel fall off and get ran over by your ball end mill, which I had happen last week, then it's important to have another V-wheel on hand. So luckily I did, but if I didn't, I would have been down for two days and that just delays the time that it takes to produce these things. All right, number eight, think about your end product and work backwards to optimize. What I mean by that is picture what you're making, what you're designing, in the end user's hand. If you can do something ahead of time, whether it's in design, whether it's uh, in the location of tabs, whether it's in a roughing and finishing pass, I always like to think about how something is gonna be used or what if I'm gonna have to do later, if it's gonna save me time or work better. All right, number nine, keeping your products to two different wood species. I think this is really important because sourcing material um, can be difficult and when you have all these, so when you make these things, you're going to have all these requests from people, hey, can you make this out of cherry or hey, can you make this out of this and make this out of that. So you have to think about, you have to find that stock, you have to buy that stock. Hopefully it's good stock. I've ran into issues where I've bought walnut that wasn't dry and the reason I say two is pick a dark wood and a light wood. Now, most people aren't going to care really what it's made out of. That's a general statement. So I think we can all relate to this. Giving people fewer options makes them more inclined to make a decision to purchase one of them. If you give them 10 options, they're going to get overwhelmed and, and be like, oh, I don't know. And it's just so much work on the back end. It's not worth it. So I limit my designs to two colors, two different kinds of woods, walnut and maple. All right, number 10, clamping techniques. Now, I've gone through a bunch of different clamping techniques and I've broken bits on clamps. I've done so much. What I do is I've installed stop blocks on the X and Y axis and that keeps my zeroing point consistent. So everything is off the bottom left corner from this point of, that these two stop blocks create. And then when I mill all my lumber down to the specified sizes, it's all just rinse and repeat. Z, all the Z heights the same, everything is the same. I found the peace of mind, so clamps don't break loose, double-sided tape doesn't break loose, I screw directly into my waste board. You'd be surprised. I mean, I've created hundreds of trays this way and it works for me. So I think if you're going for more precise milling operations, this tactic wouldn't work or metal wouldn't work. Um, in that sense, you'd have to use some clamps. So I do have T-Track, I do have inline clamps, I do have those things, but you know, it's easy just to go. And I drill a pilot hole in the two ends of my stock and zip some screws in it and we're going to town. And since everything is exactly laid out, I know I'm not gonna hit the screws. So those are my top 10 things that I've learned. Uh, and I would love to hear from you guys. If there is anything that's applicable um, that I could do better, please tell me down in the comments because I am constantly revising and uh, coming up with better ways and more efficient ways. So I encourage you, if something like this is your goal, 
uh, to invest in things that make you money. With the price of literally everything skyrocketing, you may be looking for a new side hustle. I've covered this before here on my channel with videos like how to make and sell new products, how to make a hundred wooden trays, and how I made my first $100,000 with my Shapeoko CNC. But for someone that has zero experience in CNC, is it really worth the time and money investment to get started? The short answer is yes. In the world we live in today, it's entirely possible for someone with zero prior CNC experience to start making things and selling them from their home. I don't wanna just graze over this fact though. It's simply mind blowing that this technology is so accessible today. 10 years ago, this wasn't even possible. And today the investment versus the return on investment is just staggering. For me, I stumbled upon the world of CNC four years ago. Before that, I didn't even know it existed outside of a large industrial setting. I discovered it a lot like you are discovering it now through YouTube. As I was getting into traditional woodworking and making cutting boards in my basement, I started to get curious about what a desktop CNC machine could do for my business. I thought it could be beneficial to customize my cutting boards with engravings or to do some sign making. I've always been savvy when it comes to how I can make money with something. So I saw the potential and purchased my first machine after doing a little research. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Like, zero idea. My first machine was the Shapeoko 3 XXL and I purchased it entirely with my own money. Now, this video is not sponsored by any way. I'm simply sharing that as that is where I started. Some of you may be asking, why did you go with Shapeoko? Honestly, I had it down to the Shapeoko and X-Carve, and I thought the Shapeoko was the superior machine for the price point. So I purchased the Shapeoko and the cost was around $2,000 at that time. That's a $2,000 investment that can easily, and I mean easily, 10X itself in six months. Literally, I know of people that have made their initial machine investment back in one weekend at one festival selling the things that they make. That's crazy. It didn't happen that quickly for me. It took me about six months to coop back my machine investment. And that was because I was really just figuring out what I wanted to do. I was still working a full time job at the time. So there really wasn't the pressure um, to produce. I took a little longer to get into it and uh, figure out really the direction I wanted to go. So just like anything else, it takes time to learn something new. CNC machines don't automatically spit the product out after you put a piece of wood in it. This isn't sorcery, but with a little time and energy, the potential of your return on investment is huge. So what makes this all possible today? Just like any technology, it becomes more accessible over time. So I've identified three areas that need to be in place for this to work. One, you need to have affordable, reliable, and easy to use CNC machines. Two, we need to have affordable and easy to use software. And three, we need to have the educational resources for people to learn how to use the first two. There are companies out there that have made it their mission to make CNC accessible to as many people as possible by excelling in one or all of the three areas. All right, so we've talked about machines. Let's talk about software. This is a common pain point for people. In order to make something on your CNC, you need to have software to design what you wanna make and then have a program that will convert that design to G-code so your machine software can cut out the design. So that sounds complicated and in the background it is, but the CNC software companies have been making it really easy to eliminate and make that a lot, that transition a lot easier. So Carbide Create, Easel, Vectric, CarveCo, just to name a few softwares. Again, not sponsored at all, but they're all designed for this purpose, to make it as easy, but keep functionality to make the things that you want to make so you can sell them. Educational resources are just as important as the first two. The resources available are plentiful between the resources from the CNC machine manufacturers, videos on YouTube, forums, and the many other resources that are available, I believe anybody can learn how to use a CNC. So when you add all these things together, it creates an environment that I was describing previously. A once industrial only technology is now accessible to everyone. So over the past few years, this has become my passion and goal to introduce as many people as possible to the world of CNC and to show you 
how to make money from it. All right, so if I was starting my business all over today, the number one thing I would do is invest more into myself and I would do it sooner. So that includes reading books, that includes uh, listening to podcasts, that includes watching YouTube videos, and that includes hiring a business mentor uh, sooner. I don't think there is a better return on your investment than investing into yourself. Uh, the, the things that you can learn, they compound on each other and you just get better over time. And it's not like you lose, uh, you know, I learned X, Y, and Z over the past six years. I don't lose those things. Like I have that experience. Uh, and like I said, it compounds on itself. So I would invest in myself sooner than I did. All right, number two is I would trust my gut more often and sooner. Now, I think about this in terms of pivoting. There are several um, pivoting, actually, there's a lot of pivoting in small business, um, and I've had to pivot a lot. You know, I, I think something is gonna work. It didn't work the way I thought it was going to, but this worked, so let's pivot this way, and then let's pivot this way. And so there's a lot of pivoting. And a lot of times, um, I'm hesitant to make big decisions and even though I think that's natural but even though that I I know it in my gut and I'm like you know what this is the direction I need to go another thing that I've identified with this hesitation is it usually involves like trusting my gut and making a decision it usually involves going a new direction which is uncomfortable because I'm unfamiliar with it so it's really just wanting to stay in my comfort zone but obviously what that does is that doesn't I don't grow um, when I'm comfortable. So if I was starting again today, I would trust myself and trust my gut sooner. Number three, I would identify my customer and what their needs are before building an audience. So one thing that I've learned is that the most efficient way, now I don't know if this is 100% realistic, but it's kind of, the, it's the goal. Uh, the most efficient way to sell a product, whatever that product is or service, is to identify the person first. Okay, this person needs this. And then making that, and then selling it to that person. I think a lot of times, myself included, I've made things, whether that be physical products, whether that be content, whether, it doesn't matter what it is, I've made things, and then I've went and found the person, um, or tried to find the person, when it would have been a lot more efficient uh, both time and money efficient, if I would have identified that person first, identified their problem, and made a product for that person. I think here on YouTube, it's a prime example. Uh, if you do your research first, uh, if you're going to create YouTube videos or content, um, if you do your research on a niche first, uh, and figure out everything that you can about that niche, what their pain points are, what, what they want, what they don't want, and then start making content for that specific person, you'll be a lot more successful, way more successful, than if you just start making content blindly and then kind of pivot a million times and eventually find your niche. Um, it's just a lot more efficient to do it the other way. Now, I pivoted a hundred times, a million times, whatever, uh, and that's, I, I've, I've, it's kind of worked, but it would work a lot better if I did it the other way. Number four, I would spend a whole lot less time trying to figure out an easier way to do something. I think this is human nature, again, that we uh, normally want to take the path of least resistance I think that's kind of like the default mode. I'm not saying everybody does that, but that's kind of default. Um, and it's been no different for me. So if I would have just did the hard thing the hard way, it would have been done and over with way before I figured out an easier way. And then I could have taken that, what I learned from the hard way and got better every time. And it becomes easier and it becomes more efficient. Now, a lot of times there isn't an easier way. You just have to just buckle up and you have to do the hard thing. All right, so number five is the most simple, but the hardest on this entire list. And I really believe that it's keeping me currently right now um, from getting to the next level in my business. And that is focus. Something struck me about this. I was reading an article the other day. Someone interviewed uh, billionaires uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they're investors, billionaire investors. And they interviewed them separately and they asked them both 
the same question. They said, uh, if you could sum up your success in one word, what would it be? And they both said the same exact answer separately. And they summed it up in the word focus. And I think it is so simple um, that people overlook it and they feel like they got to be a million different places. But if you can put concentrated effort for X a period of time, uh, in, in Warren Buffett's case, 90 years or whatever, um, that is where progress is made. So this is something that I'm really trying to work on is staying focused on my mission, staying focused on Andy Bird Builds and helping people make money with their CNC and not getting caught up in all the million different distractions that are coming my way. Hey, if you're getting value out of this video, hit that thumbs up button and the subscribe button. That way I know that you are getting value out of this video and I can make more content just like this. All right, number six, what I would do if I was starting my business today is give myself more grace. I would be more patient with myself. Uh, I am my own worst critic, I'm my own worst enemy, probably like a lot of you, and uh, but it really doesn't do any good. When I'm trying something new, I almost expect myself to be better at it than I am. And then I get frustrated because like, Andy, you should be better at this. Well, no, you dummy, you shouldn't because you've never done it before. <laughs> but having that mentality literally does nothing for me. There's no benefit, it is all negative. So I would be pa more patient with myself and give myself more grace. All right, number seven is I would get more customer feedback. I think this is something that businesses in general overlook, uh, but it's an absolute gold mine. If you can uh, put a product out and get direct customer uh, target customer feedback and iterate on that and not take it personally and make the best possible product for your customer like that is a win-win win 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 and i think one it's very time consuming just listening and 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 slowing down and listening to your customer uh, literally could be the key to unlocking your business potential number eight is i would hire professionals sooner meaning i would hire an accountant i would hire a graphic designer i would hire a video editor those types of people that do one thing really really well now obviously most small business owners can't just run out and hire all these people unless you just have a pile of cash sitting around then go for it um, but the normal small business owner is wearing a ton of different hats and you kind of have to do it all but i'll tell you a secret to unlocking um, your business, full business potential, is hiring people that are better at you at a certain thing. Sure, you can take the time to learn every single skill, but you are only one person, and at some point, your time is gonna be the limiting factor. Every time I have hired one of these positions, I have always thought, man, I wish I would've done that sooner. So it would take me 10 hours to edit a video, I hire a video editor, and it takes them two hours to edit and I have to pay them X amount of money. Um, but I just freed up 10 hours of my time for what I'm paying them. So now I can take those 10 hours and I can develop new products or I can mar market more. Um, I can go, I have that, I'm multiplying my time. So I would hire professionals that have specific skill sets um, to free up more of my time. And I would do that as soon as I could. Number nine is I would give my mind more space to think. Our brains need white space, need blank space in order to process information to come up with our next best idea. If you're anything like me, I feel like, I naturally feel like that I have to keep my nose to the grindstone and I have to just crank out work. It's kind of like just a battering ram. You know, just if I hit the wall enough times, it will come down, um, which can be true, but there is another way uh, and I feel like if uh, what I've learned is the times that I've given myself, uh, given my mind some time to breathe, to process, to think, uh, whether that be a bike ride, whether that be a walk, whether that be a drive, whether that be a long shower, um, I've always came away with better ideas than I had before. So I would give myself some space to process and think about things and come up with ideas. All right, so number 10. The thing I would do if I was starting all over today is I would do the hard thing first. I would do the thing I didn't want to do first. 
I kind of categorize work into two categories. There is easy work and hard work. Easy work, think about low hanging fruit, think about busy work, um, work that makes you feel productive at the end of the day, um, but doesn't actually, when you step back and think about it, doesn't actually move the needle, right? Doesn't actually make forward progress. Uh, and then hard work is work that I don't wanna do, work that makes me uncomfortable, work where I have to learn something new uh, or have to go talk to somebody or, um, you know, just those uncomfortable things that we shy away from. Those are the things that actually move the needle in the direction that we wanna go. So something that I found to be effective is to do the hard work first. Like you set the things that you don't wanna do uh, at the beginning of the day, like I'm gonna do these things first. And then after that, I'm gonna do all of the other work. And that way you force yourself, like I gotta do this work before I can do this other work. So that way every day you are forced to do hard work, but every single day you're actually moving the needle forward. Because normally what happens is I make a whole list and I do all the things that I wanna do. And then it gets me into that point where I'm like, well, I didn't really, I, I feel like I made progress, but I didn't actually make progress. I've learned over and over again that the only thing between me and where I want to go is just a ton of freaking hard work. Hard work that necessarily isn't fun. Uh, this reminds me uh, in college, I had a friend, we were, I don't know what we were talking about, but uh, he told me that his, something that his dad used to always tell him growing up is like, if, if work was supposed to be fun, then they wouldn't call it work. It would call, be called something else. And I know that's really simple, but it's true. Work is work. I think it's really easy to be like, oh, I want to have fun working. Well, that's not necessarily the goal of work. Work is, is, is not the same as fun. So cheers to all you out there doing hard work um, to get where you want to go. If you like this video and want to learn how to get into CNC yourself, I've put together this video right here. Click right here and that video will show you exactly what it takes to get started in CNC. Click right there and I will see you in that video. Mm -hmm.